Welcome to the Home Grow Series, presented by the Evolution Magazine. It is Thursday evening, November 5th, 2020, here at Happy Rock Farms in Kansas City. Tonight's host is Eric McSwain with the Missouri Cannabis Industry Association. Joining Eric for a table discussion is Joni Harshman from Harshman Law Firm and local law officer Ryan Hutton with Extract Ed. Be sure to have your questions ready and tag your friends for tonight's giveaways. Our show will begin shortly, but first, a word from our sponsor. The Missouri Cannabis Industry Association is working toward a cannabis industry that maintains local control over a free market full of genuine Missouri-owned businesses. This free market should facilitate access to quality medicine at affordable prices. We mention prices because we don't feel like it's adequate to simply have medical cannabis available. An adequate supply must be available at affordable prices so that patients can purchase as much medication as they need and aren't limited strictly by finances. We feel the best route to accomplish this is to lift total license caps for the industry because by doing so, natural market competition will create supplies and prices that are very patient friendly. We are also working to amend the Missouri Constitution to allow for adult use cannabis, protect home growers' rights, and to expand the caregiver program so that your fine skills can help more people have access to the medicine they need. These initiatives sound appealing to you. We need your help. Your help will strengthen our voice and include your own. With memberships starting at $10 a month, check out mocia.org for more information on benefits and discounts. Now, sit back, relax with your favorite medicine, and enjoy the show. Extract Ed, Concentrated Education. Legal medical marijuana has recently become a new reality for Missouri. Using thorough research of the law, roadside experience, and collaboration with other states who are at the forefront of medical and recreational marijuana, one of Extract Ed's missions became to provide insight and education to law enforcement and civilian entities. Their goal is to collectively prepare society so we can successfully navigate the challenges of legal marijuana together. Find them at extract-ed.com to learn more. The Harshman Law Firm is proud to play an important role in the historical implementation of Article 14, the way Missouri voters intended, ensuring patients' right to access medical cannabis. The firm's primary focus is cannabis law, including business formation, denied facility appeals, compliance and consulting, and patients' rights. Attorney Joni Harshman works overtime to advocate with the support of the cannabis community for fair and just integration of the new law into existing law. Visit CannabisLawKC.com to learn more. Hey everybody, Big V here coming to you from Kansas City. And there's so many exciting things going on here since we've been given the freedom to use medical cannabis. And one of the things that we've been given the freedom to do is to grow our own cannabis. And so there's a lot of people out there right now, maybe you're one of them, who's thinking about growing their own medication so they're not spending the high prices that it costs to get it from the dispensary or wherever they're gonna get it from. And that's where I come in. I'm gonna teach you from start to finish how to grow your own medication, what equipment you need, uh, get you set up and work with you to customize a program that fits your particular situation. Most of my clients that come to me, they're new, they've never grown at all, and they have absolutely no idea where to start. And so I'm gonna walk you through and help you understand the laws. I'm gonna help you understand how to stay compliant and teach you how to do all the little things that you need to know to be successful from here on out. So uh, if you're struggling, maybe you've been out there looking through the internet trying to find the answers and you just can't get them all together in one place, get a hold of me, KC Grow Coach, www.kcgrowcoach.com and I can definitely help you get 
to where you want to go and accomplish your goals as far as cultivating your own medication. Green Jean Turpin here backstage at the Canifest Bowl Nationals, the Auto Growathon, a four state competition pitting grower against grower, where they all grow the magic melon auto flower from Humboldt Seeds. Tonight, I'm joined by the Missouri Show Madman. Me. What brings you into this competition, sir? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing, Green Jean 25 large and I'm gonna be in charge when I put my stamp on the rest of the competition well, there you have it the madman means business we're gonna kick this back to you Bill Harvest 360 is a veteran-led and veteran-focused organization committed to developing a fair and equitable cannabis industry in Missouri and across the United States. They are excited to shine a light on the stories of veterans who are benefiting from cannabis and who are demonstrating great leadership in the industry and activist arenas. They believe that the re-legalization of cannabis and hemp is a paradigm shift that will result in better health outcomes as well as business and employment opportunities for veterans and their families. Join them throughout the month of November as they celebrate America's military heritage and the veterans who have served to defend the United States and her allies. Tonight's episode is streaming live from Happy Rock Farms, conveniently located in the heart of Midtown Kansas City, Missouri. Happy Rock Farms strives every day to provide the very best equipment, tools, supplies, and expertise to growers at all experience levels. Owned and operated by growers for growers, more than just another retail store, a space for research, learning, and community building. With a price match guarantee, you can rest assured that you always get the best products for the best price in town. Open daily from 10 to 7, Sundays noon to 4, Happy Rock Farms, Fine Gardening, and Hydroponic Solutions. Tonight's video is provided by Cat King Films. Check this out. Cat King Films is offering promotional content, commercials, training videos, wedding videos, and documentary style video production at an affordable price. A free consultation comes with every project to ensure that it is personalized to your brand. Check out previous projects by exploring the different sections on the newly launched website at catkingfilms.com. Level Up Audio Visuals is your local source for cutting edge audio, visual, and lighting technology. From digital signage and animated menu boards to multi-room audio and video distribution. Need a little help with live broadcasting? Do you want to learn about the many new tools to take your content to the next level? We can help you level up. Visit our website today, levelupav.com. We can even put graphics on a cake. Please take a moment to acknowledge our network affiliates and streaming affiliates across the state of Missouri. The Home Grow Series is made possible by the cooperation of many groups coming together to provide an educational platform for the community. We'd like to thank all our affiliates and sponsors and will feature different groups each week. Now stay tuned for the Home Grow Series starting at 7 p.m. just moments ahead. Welcome to the Home Grow Series, presented by Evolution Magazine. It is Thursday evening, November 5th, 2020. 
here at Happy Rock Farms in Kansas City. Tonight's host is Eric McSwain with the Missouri Cannabis Industry Association. Joining Eric for a table discussion is Joni Harshman from Harshman Law Firm and local law officer Ryan Hutton with Extract Ed. Be sure to have your questions ready and tag your friends for tonight's giveaways. Our show will begin shortly, but first, a word from our sponsor. The Missouri Cannabis Industry Association is working toward a cannabis industry that maintains local control over a free market full of genuine Missouri-owned businesses. This free market should facilitate access to quality medicine at affordable prices. We mention prices because we don't feel like it's adequate to simply have medical cannabis available. An adequate supply must be available at affordable prices so that patients can purchase as much medication as they need and aren't limited strictly by finances. We feel the best route to accomplish this is to lift total license caps for the industry because by doing so, natural market competition will create supplies and prices that are very patient friendly. We are also working to amend the Missouri Constitution to allow for adult use cannabis, protect home growers' rights, and to expand the caregiver program so that your fine skills can help more people have access to the medicine they need. If these initiatives sound appealing to you, we need your help. Your help will strengthen our voice and include your own. With memberships starting at $10 a month, check out mocia.org for more information on benefits and discounts. Now, sit back, relax with your favorite medicine, and enjoy the show. Extract Ed. Concentrated Education. Legal medical marijuana has recently become a new reality for Missouri. Using thorough research of the law, roadside experience, and collaboration with other states who are at the forefront of medical and recreational marijuana, one of Extract Ed's missions became to provide insight and education to law enforcement and civilian entities. Their goal is to collectively prepare society so we can successfully navigate the challenges of legal marijuana together. Find them at extract-ed.com to learn more. The Harshman Law Firm is proud to play an important role in the historical implementation of Article 14, the way Missouri voters intended, ensuring patients' right to access medical cannabis. The firm's primary focus is cannabis law, including business formation, denied facility appeals, compliance and consulting, and patients' rights. Attorney Joni Harshman works overtime to advocate with the support of the cannabis community for fair and just integration of the new law into existing law. Visit CannabisLawKC.com to learn more. Hey everybody, Big V here coming to you from Kansas City and there's so many exciting things going on here since we've been given the freedom to use medical cannabis and one of the things that we've been given the freedom to do is to grow our own cannabis and so there's a lot of people out there right now, maybe you're one of them, who's thinking about growing their own medication so they're not spending the high prices that it costs to get it from the dispensary or wherever they're going to get it from and that's where I come in. I'm going to teach you from start to finish how to grow your own medication, what equipment you need, uh, get you set up and work with you to customize a program that fits your particular situation. Most of my clients that come to me, they're new, they've never grown at all, and they have absolutely no idea where to start. And so I'm gonna walk you through and help you understand the laws. I'm gonna help you understand how to stay compliant teach you how to do all the little things that you need to know to be successful from here on out. So uh, if you're struggling, maybe you've been out there looking through the internet trying to find the answers and you just can't get them all together in one place, get a hold of me, KC Grow Coach, www.kcgrowcoach.com and I can definitely help you get to where you want to go and accomplish your goals as far as cultivating your own medication.
Green Jean Turpin here backstage at the Canafest Bowl Nationals, the Auto Growathon, a four state competition pitting grower against grower, where they all grow the magic melon auto flower from Humboldt seeds. Tonight, I'm joined by the Missouri Madman. What brings you into this competition, sir? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing, Green Jean. 25 large and i'm gonna be in charge when i put my stamp on the rest of the competition there you have it the madman means business we're gonna kick this back to you bill Harvest 360 is a veteran-led and veteran-focused organization committed to developing a fair and equitable cannabis industry in Missouri and across the United States. They are excited to shine a light on the stories of veterans who are benefiting from cannabis and who are demonstrating great leadership in the industry and activist arenas. They believe that the re-legalization of cannabis and hemp is a paradigm shift that will result in better health outcomes as well as business and employment opportunities for veterans and their families. Join them throughout the month of November as they celebrate America's military heritage and the veterans who have served to defend the United States and her allies. Tonight's episode is streaming live from Happy Rock Farms, conveniently located in the heart of Midtown Kansas City, Missouri. Happy Rock Farms strives every day to provide the very best equipment, tools, supplies, and expertise to growers at all experience levels. Owned and operated by growers for growers, more than just another retail store, a space for research, learning, and community building. With a price match guarantee, you can rest assured that you always get the best products for the best price in town. Open daily from 10 to 7, Sundays noon to 4, Happy Rock Farms, Fine Gardening, and Hydroponic Solutions. Tonight's video is provided by Cat King Films. Check this out. Cat King Films is offering promotional content, commercials, training videos, wedding videos, and documentary style video production at an affordable price. A free consultation comes with every project to ensure that it is personalized to your brand. Check out previous projects by exploring the different sections on the newly launched website at catkingfilms.com. Level Up Audio Visuals is your local source for cutting edge audio, visual, and lighting technology. From digital signage and animated menu boards to multi-room audio and video distribution. Need a little help with live broadcasting? Do you want to learn about the many new tools to take your content to the next level? We can help you level up. Visit our website today, levelupav.com. We can even put graphics on a kit. Please take a moment to acknowledge our network affiliates and streaming affiliates across the state of Missouri. The Home Grow Series is made possible by the cooperation of many groups coming together to provide an educational platform for the community. We'd like to thank all our affiliates and sponsors and will feature different groups each week. Now stay tuned for the Home Grow Series starting at 7 p.m. just moments ahead. Let's start over. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, live shows always, uh, we have some difficulties here and there. But uh, this is episode 30 of the Home Grow series. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're shooting live here from Happy Rock Farms on, in, on Main Street in Kansas City. Uh, we have a great show for you guys tonight. We have Eric McSwain with MCIA. 
uh, Missouri's first uh, cannabis industry association. And we have the only two groups here in Missouri that are actively training police officers on medical marijuana patients' rights, uh, what they can and can't do with the new laws and regulations that have come out since medical marijuana passed here in Missouri. Uh, Joni Harshman with Harshman Law Firm. A lot of you guys know her uh, actively representing patients. Uh, she's going to be here on the show tonight. And then we also have Ryan Hutton. Uh, he is a local uh, uh, police officer here in Missouri that is also training his colleagues on the, uh, the new regulations and laws with, uh, with Missouri medical marijuana patients and their rights. So a uh, really great show for you guys tonight. Uh, if you guys have questions, if you have comments, if you've had issues in the past where you got pulled over, or if you've been in some situations, please comment. Uh, please ask questions. Um, if you want to ask them a question directly, uh, Eric from MCIA, he's going to be moderating tonight. He, he has a monitor over here. Uh, he's going to be taking those questions and asking those questions live throughout the show. So we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please uh, comment. Please question. Uh, very rarely do we get uh, such talent uh, in, in one room here uh, that we have tonight, so uh, please participate and be uh, involved. Uh, before we pass it over to them, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, of course, MCIA. Uh, they've got a great patient caregiver program that they're running right now. If you are looking for a patient caregiver or if you're a patient caregiver looking to help patients, I would advise you to check out their, their membership program. They, they have all kinds of perks, uh, whether it's legal documents to protect uh, both parties, whether it's uh, training to get you educated as a patient caregiver, or whether it's telling you and giving you information on what you should be looking for if you're a patient looking for a patient caregiver. They've got all that worked out. Uh, it's a great program. You can go to their website, uh, get more information on that. I'm sure Eric will talk more about that here later tonight. Also want to give a shout out to uh, the uh, Humboldt Green and the Canifest Bowl. Uh, the Auto grow -thon is in full swing. Uh, we are only a couple months away from that competition coming to an end. Uh, Eric's going to talk a little bit later in our second half of the show about what's happening with the Happy Rock team uh, and where, uh, where everybody's at with that competition. So thank you to the, our sponsors there. Uh, Casey Grow Coach, Big V. Um, thank you so much for being a sponsor. We, he's going to have the third show this, this month. Uh, talking about uh, you know how to set up your grow room, how to make the most of your space. Uh, should be a great show. Um, and then, um, am I missing somebody? Um, I think that's everybody there on the sponsors. Uh, so, uh, yeah, our, our giveaways tonight, if you want to enter in for a chance to win two uh, $50 gift cards to Happy Rock Farms, uh, you can just tag a friend. You both can enter to win, and we're also going to give away two fifty dollar uh, $50, $50 off the patient caregiver membership with MCIA. Uh, so tag as many friends as you would like. Uh, each time you get entered in the competition to win, uh, so pl please feel free to enter that as many times as you would like. Uh, without further ado, let's pass it on over to Eric McSwain with MCIA and Ryan Hutton and Joni Harshman. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Took us in like a pro. I mean, you're getting good at this, Clay. I'm telling you. Uh, Eric McSwain here. I'm chairman of the board for uh, MCIA. Excited to be back. Uh, excited to sponsor the show as well. Uh, love the crew. It's always a good time here. And I've got some special guests with me tonight. Uh, Ryan from Extract Ed. Um, Ryan, I, you came from Rolla? You came like five hours to, to see us tonight? Uh, yeah, yeah, I drove up from Rolla uh, earlier today, but it's not that bad of a drive. Missouri's a pretty state, so it works. Right, out. right, but it's going to be dark. You heading back to Rolla? Yes, I'll be going back to Rolla tonight. Oh, but. that's amazing. Ten hours to come be with us tonight, so let's tune in. And we also have Joni Harshman Law. How are you? I'm doing good. Just, uh, you know, always uh, very, very busy going 100 miles an hour, I feel like, but trying to keep up that's right she she literally stopped work five minutes ago <laughs> so that she could be with us as well very very busy person uh, glad to have you both uh, Ryan uh, why don't you tell me first about um, you know what you do in terms of training you've got extracted I love the name by the way pretty awesome uh, tell me what you do with that 
Sure. So our main goal, uh, obviously, when uh, medical marijuana was the amendment was passed in 2018, we kind of recognized that law enforcement was probably not going to get the training they needed prior to uh, everything coming into effect here. So what we did was to get geared up for that. Uh, we put together some training uh, specifically on medical marijuana and the rules and the regulations that the Missouri uh, rules say. Uh, and then furthermore, once we really started doing some medical marijuana training, uh, we were kind of, I guess, shocked about how little law enforcement knows about uh, cannabis, the cannabis plant, uh, harvesting, growing, uh, marijuana concentrates, extracts, how they're used, and so forth. Uh, so what we did is we basically tacked on uh, some more information and give them the basic information about the world of cannabis, if you will. That's perfect. That's perfect. And. Um, you say it's pretty clear that it's needed. It's a needed service at this point, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you know, dispensaries are open, cultivation facilities are up and running. Uh, law enforcement are constantly coming into contact with somebody who has typical marijuana and then obviously the card. And the big problem is, well, now that we have marijuana and a card, what do we do with it, right? Uh, so our goal is to educate law enforcement here in Missouri so that they know how to react uh, when they uh, come across that, and then also to educate the patients on what you know their duties and responsibilities are as well when they get stopped by law enforcement. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's perfect. Well, and I want to come back and talk about more about some of those things. Um, but but Joni Harshman Law also does some training, right? And you practice law in the area of cannabis. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. Yes. So I um, building cannabis law practice, which is you know a wide variety of, of areas as it's developed. So I um, represent a number of businesses um, that are, you know, getting started, business formation, um, all the things that, uh, you know, a new business has to decide on their business entity, has to uh, look at trademarking and whether that's even possible, being within the cannabis industry. Um, and I also have a number of denied facility applicant appeals pending, about 15, so that keeps me busy uh, and trying to keep up with everything that's going on with the scoring craziness um, that just continues to get even crazier, it seems. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, a whole lot to keep up with. Um, <clears throat> and then, in, yes, and then the other kind of the three areas that I'm focusing on is patient rights, primarily criminal defense, you know, shockingly, there are still many, many patients who are being charged criminally, felonies, misdemeanors, getting their medicine taken from them um, when they are possessing within their legal limits. And, you know, the law amendment two language made it extremely clear for anybody that stopped to look at it that um, patients could legally possess upon receiving their medical marijuana card. And there's, there's no other conclusion that anyone can come to when you look at the mandated time frames. And the rules, the DHSS rules, even had some commentary and they're in multiple places that stated that it's important to realize 30 days after July 4th, the patients and caregivers may legally possess marijuana. That was before any facility apps card prior to dispensaries being open. And, you know, in fact, we have about, I, I don't actually have the up-to-date numbers, but I believe it was, you know, over two-thirds of the patient-approved cards are simply patient cards without a cultivation uh, authorization or a caregiver cultivation authorization. So there is no reason to issue a patient card that means nothing for a year, over a year. Um, so that's been a battle, even though I think the language and many people would agree with me in the industry that even though it's not um, said blatantly, it, it is blatantly obvious what the protection is supposed to be. Um, so it's still shocking that even at this point, over a year later that patients that are showing their card to law enforcement are still being criminally charged and even if we ultimately you know get a favorable outcome hopefully a dismissal they've expended attorney fees court costs time off of work um had their medicine confiscated and that's just not right and it's really shocking that no government entity is stepping up to reiterate and provide guidance to law enforcement 
<clears throat> and the judicial system, prosecutors, and judges, think, probation and parole. I think in, in states, that's probably a common theme, though, is that that education piece probably gets left behind. And, and Ryan, you're, you're an active law enforcement officer. Um, would you agree with that? And, and is it, you know, what if I were to say the, the main, the root of that issue is probably education? Would you agree? Yeah, 100 percent. So if you look at some other states that have legalized, whether medicinal or recreational. So, for instance, we'll, we always talk about Colorado, right? That's the state that we always go to. So Colorado legalized medical marijuana in 2000. Program came on line in about 2002. It's about how long it took. Um, I do some training out in Colorado and my most recent trip out there maybe about eight months ago, uh, maybe six months ago, and law enforcement told me since they've uh, legalized medicinal marijuana to this day, they've received no training uh, on that. And my goal here in Missouri is that we're the first state to really nip that in the bud before it gets out of hand. Uh, that way we can make sure everybody has the education that they need, and that way you don't have to call uh, you know, an attorney to maybe represent you, and we can just really take care of that first to before we get there but you know it's not just here in Missouri we're looking at you know other states that have legalized uh, we're talking earlier about the states that have legalized uh, Tuesday right so we I think we added five additional states most of them were full recreational uh, one of those just medicinal I believe that was Missis I'm sorry South Dakota or Mississippi was medicinal South Dakota added rec and uh, medicinal so they're obviously going to need some training up there uh, you know but who's going to take the lead and end up doing that the answer is we don't know and being familiar with other states, I mean, what, what kind of big concerns do you see coming out of those regions that are established under those laws? Sure. So the big concern is uh, officers just not having the information on what to do. So, you know, if you look at the, the Controlled Substance Act came into play in 1971, that's when, you know, marijuana was officially on the schedule list. So since 1971, cops have smelled marijuana, we've seen marijuana, and then what do we do? Why we make an arrest. Well, the issue with that is things are slowly changing, uh, especially here in Missouri. We have the medicinal stuff. So now that stuff has changed, right? So uh, possession and odor does not add automatically mean arrest. So what we need to get is officers to understand the difference between uh, what is legal and what is not, right? So uh, if we can get them the medical information, I think it will be good for, and I hate to say sides, but both sides here, so that way we can move forward successfully, right? Mm -hmm. no, that's, that sounds good. And, and Joni, do you, uh, have you seen in your law practice cases that, that reflect that in terms of you know, odor being probable cause, that sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, in the cases that um, I have um, represented patients on and non-patients, um, we, you know, one of my first big cases was uh, the Jamie Wilson case up in Davies County um, that I entered my appearance on uh, December last year. And, you know, interesting, you know, he, he was held on a $75,000 cash only bond. I mean, that's, you know, just really extreme given the charges. Um, and so, there, you know, there's a number of issues in that, and I can talk about it because it was a fairly publicized case, and he was very open about some of the issues in that case. And, and you know, there was a child endangerment charge because of his medicine being within reach of his grandson. Um, however, you know, then you know, we made the whole argument, well, what would happen if he ingested that dried flour? Nothing because there's no you know, decarboxylation process going on that would have activated the THC to give him the psychoactive effects. And so, um, you know, but the prosecutor had no idea what we were talking about. Sure. And so, you know, anyone within the judicial system, um, from law enforcement to prosecutors, especially prosecutors, Judges, they need to take some initiative to educate themselves if they are not getting the guidance from some other entity. Um, that prosecutor was citing rules in her response to the first motion to dismiss by the public defender that applied to facilities, it had nothing to do with patients or caregivers. She clearly did not know what she was saying. Sure. It, it, you know, so, you know, that's. You know, in a private practice, that's malpractice to not know the law and what you're arguing, um, just blatantly making irrelevant uh, statements. And so, but I could say I have 
I had currently have three cases right now um, by out-of-staters, and as many of you know, out-of-staters that have a medical marijuana card are also protected from criminal sanctions and have immunity in our state if they have a card. Um, and then I also have about three other cases, three or four, and I've already disposed of several others that were all patients being charged with felony felony possession and the, while being under their legal limits. Um, and yes, it's odor. And so the odor issue is something that I'm taking on. I just filed several motions to dismiss specifically addressing that. And I'll say initially I felt like the argument against odor being probable cause was certainly much stronger for patients upon showing their card. Um, but after doing the research in about 32 other states that have come before us, um, that argument goes across the board for anybody in the state, in my opinion. And those are the arguments I made. Because historically, yes, odor alone was probable cause um, because they, it had no legality. Um, but now we have reasons we have a program that makes it illegal. I cited five reasons why, um, five legal scenarios that could explain the odor of cannabis on somebody that's pulled over for in a traffic stop. And that would be they may be a valid medical marijuana card holder. Maybe they have their medication in their vehicle. Um, they may be a valid out-of-state medical cannabis card holder. Um, maybe they used or medicated or was with somebody who medicated, you know, several hours before in another legal state before they drove into Missouri. Um, and then we also, and then we have like, well, what if their family member is a patient and they live with them and that family member happened to medicate around them and it, you know, certainly can transfer onto your clothes if you're within the vicinity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's an issue I have brought up to all these facilities, uh, you know, that are working, going to be working in the cultivation facilities, the dispensaries, handling it. Just by being around it, it gets <clears throat> absorbed into your person, sure. your clothes, your, you know, your belongings, sure. everything. You may have not even consumed anything and just reek of it when you leave work. Especially so I'm like, are you going to have, you're going to need I to mean, have some, you know, <laughs> some right. sanitizing rooms before they leave work that's if you're right. going to protect your employees. And, and are you, are you hearing that sort of thing whenever you're conducting training, Ryan? I mean, uh, about the odor issue in particular or? Yeah, so, I mean, odor is a touchy subject right now, right? So there's there's a couple court cases out there. There are several uh, court cases that uh, have been addressed that talk about the, the odor of marijuana. Now, this is not in Missouri, so that's important to talk about, right? So we don't have any uh, cases yet here in Missouri. So what we do is we look at what are other states doing, right, so that we can kind of base what we're going to do here. Uh, so there's a lot of cases out there that say the odor of marijuana um, is still probable cause to search the car. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, when law enforcement does stop you. Now, maybe that changes in six months. Maybe it changes in a year. We don't really know that. Um, but really what we're training uh, officers is if you stop somebody, you smell the odor of cannabis, and you're presented with a uh, qualified patient primary caregiver card, um, and you have no other probable cause or developed probable cause to search the car, then it's all good, right? So everything's fine. Um, but there, again, there's several cases that talk about, and uh, I got four of them here in front of me that talk about even if uh, somebody does present a card and law enforcement ends up developing a probable cause beyond that, that they're still okay to search it. Now, again, I'm not saying uh, that's what's going to happen. But what I'm saying is that's what other states are saying right now. I would like for some clarification here in Missouri. Um, but right now, I think that she would agree with me. We're kind of just doing the best we can with what we have. So if there's no other probable cause, you know, law enforcement has no reason to search it. So if they're presented with a card uh, that's valid and then the odor itself, they are not should not be searching your car at that point unless there's more to it. I don't know if you would agree with Well. I would not agree that if somebody does not produce their medical marijuana card and an officer smells the odor of marijuana, that they then, on that basis alone, 
have probable cause. Historically in Missouri, yes. But no, there are about five Supreme Court cases from other states, recent ones, Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, Colorado, Pennsylvania on September 25th, that are all saying that the odor alone cannot, is not enough. There has to be something more in addition. So um, officers are, are able to form reasonable suspicion turning into probable cause to search when there are enough factors that create a totality of circumstances um, to create that probable cause to allow them to do that warrantless search. Um, vehicles, you know, have a heightened, um, mo obviously, mobility and safety issues, and, and that's part of the reason why it's an exception to the warrant requirement under the Fourth Amendment. Um, but, you know, there's so many, all of the cases are seeing that it's not that clear anymore. It's not, com uh, it's not, uh, you can't just say, okay, we well, have odor, now we can search. You can't just bring in a dog and say, oh, they alerted, now we can search. Because even there was a case, one of the Supreme Court cases, um, they brought in a dog and um, the dog alerted and they found meth. Okay, and, and the interesting what the court, uh, how the court looked at that was because maybe there had previously been marijuana in there. Maybe a patient had been in the car that had their medicine. And all these dogs are trained to alert on the odor of marijuana. They can't distinguish between legal odor and illegal odor. And so I would argue that it is not it should not be allowed to bring in a draw a dog to you know to create that probable cause for the search there has to be more than that um and so in, in addition to, you know the other issue is that new law we have is the farm bill in 2018 so we have the odor of hemp so many law enforcement you know yeah. uh, or anyone would have a very very difficult time distinguishing between legal hemp and illegal cannabis well and so so our our viewers are have are, you know there's a lot of home growers out there there's a lot of medical patients in missouri that sort of thing you know you can pretty much guarantee our audience has a card right or is interested or knows somebody who has one um so let's talk you know i think we can agree that the the most uh, frequent time that law enforcement and a patient will interact is going to be in a traffic stop, right? So let's talk about transporting your medicine. Let's talk about that sort of thing. You know, we've got a question, and by the way, send in those questions because I'll stop the show immediately to ask these pros that we've got in front of us. Um, uh, so first of all, keep it in an airtight container so you can't smell it, right? We just talked for like 15 minutes on odor, I think we can get that one right out of the way. Keep that stuff sealed up. What, what else are we thinking uh, that's going to keep you from getting pulled over or that scent of odor or whatever in the first place? Me first, go ahead. Okay, well, I'm trying to address this, and I think, you know, the initial thought once, now that we have a legal program is, okay, we should be good to go, you know, but that's not the case. My advice is you still need to proceed with caution because as we've stated, you know, there's just not enough education uh, to know how to properly handle uh, these situations now that we have a legal program. Um, so, you know, follow the traffic laws. Um, Obviously, in particular, if you're transporting your medication or you feel that you may have the odor on you because uh, you had medicated at home several hours before, obviously, it's still illegal to drive and medicate or drive under the influence um, to the point where you are, uh, you know, not able, considered intoxicated or, uh, you know, not, not able to safely operate your vehicle. Um, but I think everybody needs to basically proceed like it's not legal so don't even if i get a card i shouldn't just fire it up going down the road exactly no. No. that would not, <laughs> not that would not idea. be allowed <laughs> within our uh well, well, what about you know so maybe i should keep it out of my reach lock containers i mean what's 
What's the idea there? Sure. So, in, of course, every every stop's different, right? And um, really, just kind of go back just a minute. I would like to get, for law enforcement to get educated enough where we can educate patients when we stop them that are not doing it correctly. So rather than say, hey, you're under arrest, I say, listen, here's what you need to be doing. Um, here's the, uh, the the rule, what the rules say. Do this from now on. Go down the road that you go, right? So it's an education on both sides. Um, but, yeah, so number one, um, don't. I say don't be nervous, but that's a, that's a unique situation, right? When an officer walks up and you have cannabis, even if it's legal, you're going to be just naturally uh, it's newly legal. naturally nervous. Um, and I really recommend being straightforward, right? Hey, listen, officer, this is what I have. I'm a medical marijuana patient. Um, here's my ID. Here's my card. And I could almost bet you a mid-level steak dinner that the officer is going to ask them, hey, uh, what do you have in your car, <clears throat> right? And um, I don't think that that's necessarily to investigate a crime. This is new to us as well, right? So there's a lot of officers that have never seen wax, that have never seen, um, you know, cartridges or anything like that. So this is kind of new to us. Um, and I'm actually kind of going from memory here, a kid that I came into contact with, I walk up, he says, officer, I am a medical marijuana patient. Here's my information. And I said, hey, man, what do you have? Just out of curiosity, more than happy to show me. Um, so we sat there and talked on the side of the road. And, you know, I don't know, you couldn't imagine this 10 years ago, but you have an officer and a cannabis user sitting here talking about um, his electronic rig, right? Um, so just because we ask questions doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we're headed down that path. Um, but I would just say uh, be co cooperative as possible and understand that this is a learning process for us as well. Yep, yep. And, and even, if, you know, so let's say I'm taking full precautions. I've got it in a locked, airtight container. Uh, it's in the back of the car, but for some reason maybe my clothes still smell like it a little bit. Officer decides to search me. Uh, while they're searching the car, can they search that locked container as well? So given the exact uh, situation that you told me, I wouldn't search the car personally. Um, I think you said you were a medical marijuana patient, right? Mm -hmm. So um, really, if you present me with the card and there is the odor still, now this is my opinion, so right, we haven't figured this stuff out yet, mm -hmm. but in my opinion, there's really no need to proceed further unless we start to develop other probable cause beyond that, right? So simply the odor, simply yeah. the card. Signs of intoxication. Should not be, exactly, right? So that simply that's not enough. So I wouldn't even go to the point where I'm going, I'm going to search you there. And I don't think uh, uh, most guys would do that um, unless there's something else that we see, right? So. Sure. sure. Understood. Um, let's get back real quick to the education piece because I'm curious. Most... most um, so you educate not just uh, law enforcement, but also advocates as well. I mean, what's what's the demographic for, for some of your classes look like? Yeah, so uh, we do a couple different types of classes. Uh, we do online training, which is specifically for law enforcement because it's issued um, credit for them, continued education hours. And then we do uh, in-person training. Um, our in-person training uh, that we do for dispensaries or cannabis facilities involves both cannabis advocates and law enforcement officers. And you probably can't think of a more unique group of people to get together and then talk to. Uh, the first one that I did was at the Cassville Dispensary down in uh, Berry County, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'm going to admit that when I got cops and cannabis uh, advocates together, I was sweating. I was nervous <laughs> on, on how that was going to go. Um, but the interesting thing is, so my, my thing is I want to educate both sides so that we can get through a regular traffic stop where nobody's doing anything wrong appropriately, right? Um, but the interesting thing is by the end of the training, you see these two groups beginning to discuss things together and learn from each other. And that's really my end goal. If we can get rid of this gap that somehow has been created over the past, you know, 40, 50 years between law enforcement and now legal, right? Legal cannabis. Uh, if we can get rid of that and work together, this will go a lot smoother for both yeah, sides. For sure. You see that same sort of interaction, Joni, in your uh, session? Yes, I, mean, um, I can't tell you like what an amazing feeling it was uh, leaving the law enforcement training that I was able to be a part of that we recently did with the Platte County Sheriff's Office um, with Taproot AG also and shout uh, out yep and so you know it was it was interesting how that all came about and uh, kind of started with a hemp discussion and traffic stop and the law enforcement not really knowing 
uh, much or anything about hemp and uh, from there offering to you know let well let's have a conversation you know and because they were not getting any guidance on this and and so I can say that you know so we kind of threw uh, presentation together kind of really last minute within a couple of days it was supposed to be about three hours from nine to noon and we did have a small group but that worked out because we were really able to have a you know open forum roundtable discussion um, and a number uh, we had a number of people there from the industry clay was there and uh, Chris with happy rock and so um, it was enlightening because we could just see you know the door opening I think they had their minds like cracked open you know one of the comments in the beginning was well I think marijuana is a gateway drug in my mind, I thought, is it 1985? You know, but um, I'm like, okay, this is a tough crowd, you know, but. It takes but a while to get over that indoctrination. Exactly, but the more and more that we kind of explained the differences mm -hmm. and what, you know, what sort of um, paraphernalia that, you know, or medicating devices that people use and the difference between hemp and the fact that you can smoke hemp, you can, uh, there are multiple legal CBD products that people are using uh, for health reasons now. And so we kind of tried to do a quick overall view addressing hemp and hemp versus cannabis, the, you know, over the 0.3% of THC. Um, the officers were so engaged and so we kind of go back and forth between actually doing a presentation and just having this open discussion. Awesome. And they couldn't get enough. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, you know, we were supposed to be done by noon, but because we kept kind of getting sidetracked by all the side conversations, um, we didn't leave till like four o'clock. So it was about a seven hour presentation. Well, we didn't even break for lunch. And everybody was smiling. So and big they, success story, right? They were very excited to awesome. get some answers and some guidance. And what I see as the benefit of this law enforcement training is right. It's not just like, oh, here's your side, here's our side. We are bridging that gap. We are coming mm -hmm. together and understanding the challenges that you know that law enforcement face and they're understanding things from the perspective of a patient driver um and you know we did a test at that presentation with a with some hemp in one of their little field tests that you put you put the bud in there and it turns dark purple if it has over 0.3 percent thc and guess what it turned dark purple although it was a tested hemp bud mm -hmm. that was legal um, so that told all of us in the room their test was wrong mm -hmm. and what they said you know is that you know but they have to you you have to go by that protocol if your test says okay well it's it's not legal we'd have to arrest you and take you in even though clearly we also had yeah. you know lab work to say that it was legal um, and so you can see that there needs to be better testing for law enforcement. There, you know, dogs need to be retrained. Um, now, do you, think, do you think there's even standard protocols or is it pretty all over the board? What are you seeing, Ryan? So uh, yeah, I'm gonna agree with a lot of what she just said. So first off, uh, I like what she said about how the cops were involved and they want that. Law enforcement is basically begging for this training. What's holding them back is budget, right? A lot of departments, if you look across the entire state of Missouri, it's a very rural state, do not have the money to send 10, 15, 20 guys uh, to training or even to take them off the road. So it's not that officers are not wanting, they're wanting this training. And when you get them there, they're excited and that they're actually being taught this. Um, now going back to uh, the field test kits and stuff, uh, I think we're setting uh, law enforcement up for failure. If So you got people who are not getting the training and we have tools that are out of date, right? Um, and when you have those two things, I think you have a recipe for disaster because like she said, at, at some point we have to take that as probable cause. And once we have probable cause, we move forward um, so, you know, definitely some field test kits that maybe can differentiate. I don't even know if those exist, to be honest with you. I don't think they do yet. Um, and then going to the canine searches, that's a whole nother monster in itself. Uh, I can tell you right now that law enforcement, m 
most agencies that even have a canine, which is a very limited number, do not have the money to retrain a, 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 a dog. Uh, the dog itself is extremely expensive, and then it's just the training is also expensive. Now, if that was an option, they would definitely take it. I can guarantee it because it would uh, clear up the waters for law enforcement. So that way, you know, we don't have to have the defense get in, even involved at that point. Um, but again, money is the big issue, and then time is a big issue as well. Mm -hmm. All important topics. I mean, and beyond, I'm sure you have also some uh, common questions that come out. I mean, we talked about how advocates and, and uh, enforcement officers get together, but do both of them tend to have the same sorts of questions, or what are sure. you seeing? Sure. So um, when we do the training, uh, typically what happens, you're going to have a room, and the cops are going to sit on one side, long, and then the cannabis is going to sit on the other side. They're not going to talk to each other. They're scared. To, they're, they don't even look at each other, right? Um, but by the end of the training, and I think you'd probably agree, we have people communicating, talking back and forth. And sometimes when law enforcement asks a question, uh, I don't even have to answer it because the cannabis advocates will step up and go, oh, it's X, Y, and Z. They're know-it-alls. It's yep. fine. Well, no. And, and that's, and I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I am. It's all right. You know, I appreciate that, right? Uh, because we're building that relationship. And then what's great now that we've broken the ice is uh, – the cannabis advocates or patients, whoever's there, will ask a question. Now law enforcement goes, well, here's what we would do in that situation. Um, so I kind of let them go back and forth. But then the number one questions I get from law enforcement are uh, how much can they possess? How much can they purchase? Uh, when transporting, what, is it, what does it have to be in? And then uh, as far as cultivation, how many plants can somebody cultivate? Now, of course, we all know there's different scenarios if you have uh, caregivers or you're uh, cultivating on behalf of somebody else. So we go deep into that. Those are the number one things with law enforcement. And then with cannabis advocates, I always get the question about transporting uh, marijuana. Can I transport it from one location to another? And then um, I also get the questions about um, searching vehicles. Those are probably the, the top five questions that I get from both sides. Got it. And what do you tell them about whether they can transport it? So yeah, I mean, you know, there's obviously, it's written in there that you can transport it. Um, I recommend doing it safely. One of the gentlemen that uh, um, kind of helps me teach, you know, he, and who's a cannabis uh, advocate, um, he talks about, uh, or I don't Josh Loftus, I'm not sure if you know him, but he's, he's a oh, great yeah. guy. Uh, um, you know, I like teaching when he's there because he actually goes a step further and tells, you know, the patients in the room, hey, this is what I do. I put it in a bag. I put writing on it. I write my number on it. I set it somewhere that's away from me. So he goes above and beyond. Uh, that way it's not awkward for us when we walk up there and it's sitting in somebody's lap. So basically I always say just proceed with caution and do um, the best that you can to kind of, I don't want to say separate yourself, but that way we know that, you know, you're not actively using it while you're going down the road. But transportation, yeah, you can transport um, uh, cannabis. And then Josh also had a great point. He said, now this is coming from a cannabis advocate, there's no reason someone should be driving down the road with two pounds of weed, right? And he says when he does transport it, it's going to be his user amount, you know, whatever he needs to get him, uh, you know, if he's going to be gone for two days, it's just that amount. And I agree with that. I think that's a, a great rule to live by. You know, why have, you know, the maximum amount, just take the user amount. It's, that's my recommendation. Yep. Yep, and we, we have a certified caregiver program that we've put together, and so I'm curious if you touch on that as well, because uh, I'm a caregiver for a patient. My patient can have up to 12 ounces. Sure. Um, if he's completely out, I can theoretically bring him a whole 12 ounces. And yes. so, you know, three quarters of a pound is a pretty large number. Sure. So, um, yeah, yeah, so I didn't tell me about it. Yeah, we absolutely discussed that. So, you know, what can one uh, patient have, right? So you got your purchase, your four ounces of dried on processed marijuana, or it's equ equivalent in that 30-day time period. Or how much can you possess, which is different, right? So I can possess um, eight ounces of dried on processed marijuana or the equivalent. Now, if I am a caregiver, that's a little bit different story because if I'm purchasing or possessing on her behalf, well, now I've basically doubled the amount that I'm allowed to purchase and possess. And for instance, if you're also a patient of mine, well, now I've done what? I've tripled it. Um, so what we do is we specifically address um, step by step. This is how much one person should have or could have. This is how much one person with a patient could have. And then we just basically build and say this is, you know, the maximum amount uh, for each scenario. So we address each scenario and every Good. training that we do. Good. And they have to be labeled in the yes. right way yep. and identifiable. Yes, uh, absolutely. Pop, pop quiz. 
Can you smell the odor in the room right now? Because you've got an ounce of pretty decent stuff in the room with you. I would say yes. Yeah? But I also... Uh, Probably got a pretty sensitive nose. Yeah, I, I would say yes, fun. but... I'm not around it a whole lot, right? Sure, so I, I'm sure. probably a little more sensitive. All right. All right. Well, you, you passed. Okay. You passed. That's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> so have you put on multiple sessions at this point, Joni? And, and how many how many folks have you trained so far? Um, as far as law enforcement, no. I've just been a part of the one presentation. Like I said, it was a smaller group. Probably it was about 50% presenters and you know discussion engagers and and 50 percent law enforcement i think it was maybe seven or eight uh law enforcement okay. and, and plus it was put together at the last minute however we are planning another uh, larger uh, law enforcement training um with our same group with taproot ag and also with can convict project and uh, so we are putting together hopefully you know now that we have more time to prepare and can maybe do a little bit more <coughs> detailed and expand on what we initially presented at the last session um, and that'll be in liberty off the square um, probably the first week of january and this is going to be for ideally you know those parties we're talking about that especially need that training mm -hmm. law enforcement prosecutors judges probation and parole <laughs> officers uh dfs i mean they're getting calls and being told they have to go out and investigate somebody's grow but they don't know the rules and what they're even supposed to be looking for mm -hmm. um and so there's they need the guidance and as frustrating as it is that no government entity in Missouri is stepping up to provide that guidance. Um, you know, I think in a way, you know, it, there may be a silver lining there. It's bringing, bringing law enforcement together with patient advocates and educators, like we said, bridging that gap, having a greater understanding rather than just one entity saying, okay, here's how it is we're actually coming together having more understanding than law enforcement prosecutors you know they don't proceed kind of blindly not really knowing what they're doing and patients hopefully the end result are not going to be criminally charged unnecessarily so that's going to be a win-win if we're doing it ourselves and um you know right the activists that are involved in the industry we've studied the law we studied the That's rules. Right. We know a lot about <laughs> cannabis. So uh -huh. um, we really know it and we want to share that to benefit everyone and, you know, everybody just get along right. and, and not, right. it doesn't have to be us versus them and, anymore. And it sounds like in those future events, you might have a guest speaker <laughs> that could stop by. Now, Ryan, you've, you've done a few more trainings, right? You've trained quite a few officers at this point or yeah so I, I i did the tally last night the rough tally so right now we're looking at about um from now again we started this uh about a year and three months ago um we're looking at about 18 to 2000 um, yeah, right. that we, <laughs> now that's uh now that includes officers uh probation and parole um that includes, um, now some of those numbers were patients as well, but not very many. I want to say maybe 50, 75 patients. Um, but now that's, I, I, I do think it's a decent number, but if you look at the amount of law enforcement that's in Missouri, we're looking at about 14,500 cops in the entire state. So you look at that we've trained, let's just go with the high number, 2,000. That's a very small portion. And you also got to look at uh, the new officers that are coming through an academy every day. So we're constantly adding numbers to this pot and then taking officers who have the training away because they're retiring or moving on, right? So yes, we're maybe we're gaining ground here, but in order to get everybody trained, I think we need to start at the basic level that make it maybe a mandatory course. Um, that way, when they come through an academy, sure. um, they're already trained and we don't have to catch up. So I think I don't even think we could ever get the whole pool trained, to be honest with you. And I, I hate to say that. I just don't yep. think we could because it's a revolving door. Unless you door. embed it with the... Sure, sure. So maybe that's something we can work out um, eventually. Um, but love to help yeah. you with that. Sure. Yeah, and, and we had some ideas on that. I mean, within the industry, this is going to be a billion-dollar industry with, you know, owners of facilities and groups that are going to be making a lot of money and are going to want to 
give mm-hmm. back. We're going we're to need to talk more. Yeah. And so, you know, we can collaborate and possibly even help raise funding so that we can keep this, uh, you know, bridging the gap education going. And so, you know, we've got a lot of ideas of how we can work together, you know, to help each other. Um, you, you know, and in the, you know, one thought I have thought about is that in a way it's kind of nice for the patients, the advocates to be a part of the training because we're really being able to share from firsthand knowledge and longtime experience, you know, experiences and um, our insights as to what, you know, we deal with on that end and then law enforcement can do the same, you know, but when you say the basic training, you know, right, getting getting to the point where, you know, law enforcement has it down or has some inf- information with them all the time that tells them what the patient limits are and, and what they can have and how it should be labeled or not labeled. There's so many, you know, arrests that I see that are not just because they thought they had probable cause because of a field test or because of odor. It's just blatantly getting it wrong. So many stops where an officer said, well, there's no dispensaries open, so you can't be legally possessing when they're wrong about that. And or, you know, in my Jamie Wilson case, the officers are saying, you know, my client saying, well, the state issued me this card. Why would they issue me this card if, you know, I couldn't legally possess? I have a cultivation mm-hmm. license. And, and the uh, officer ba- said in the video, your card doesn't mean shit. And, you know, that's just wrong. And we can and, fix it through and education, and right? Absolutely. And, and so there's so many examples of just getting the basics wrong, mm-hmm. um, despite a mm-hmm. tiny bit of input from yep. <laughs> DHSS. And, and so for everybody out there, if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows the local police chief, because we're small town America, let's face it, <laughs> I went to high school with my police chief, um, let them know. Let them know that these services are out there. Maybe they can find a way. Maybe we can sponsor that education uh, to make sure it happens if it's needed in your area. Lots of things. Share it. Share it. Uh, and don't forget to tag your friends. I've got a technical question here uh, having to do, it says, can passengers in a car, I assume, medicate? Now, I'm going to take a stab and say you should pretend your car, despite the level of your window tent, should be treated as a public space and therefore no, right? That would be my recommendation, yes. <laughs> Just yeah. don't yeah. fool um, with it. I think that you can always push the envelope um, and maybe maybe it ends up being okay but i think there's a high probability that it's not so i guess my question would be why are we pushing that envelope at that point especially at this point in time when we're just getting started Mm -hmm. why throw some more mud in here and confuse everybody else my recommendation is no i'm not going to say that you can't do that but i would really recommend not doing it well and so you know i'll say that there are clearly a lot of gray areas we don't have any higher court uh, Missouri precedent yet. I'm hoping to change that. Um, so uh, what I can say is while your vehicle, you do have a, a certain uh, level of privacy um, that you're entitled to, I have seen case law from other states that specifically say um, driving on an, a public highway is within uh, a public space that which is prohibited to Medicaid within on a highway so sure. I could see that transferring you know Missouri picking that up eventually and again if you're gonna have your passenger do it and you're trying to proceed with caution that doesn't go along with the whole proceed with caution plan that's right that's right and uh, you know I couldn't agree so, and, and what I'm hearing you say too is that uh, until we've got case law until we've got judges who've you know laid down the law on these cases we 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 can't say for sure right so i guess the the good answer is maybe and do you want to be the one that goes to court over it so i don't know about you but no thanks sorry (laughs) another comment on that um that i i would say is that there's no prohibition against a passenger medicating in the vehicle so there's an argument that you can because it's not prohibited but it's just not smart right now. 
I mean, if even if you're right, who wants to be arrested? Who wants to be detained on the side of the road for two and a half hours? Who wants to bond out or maybe sit in jail overnight? Even if you're right, do, do you want to go through that? Is it really worth it? And time. By the time it you gets know. to a higher court, I mean, holy cow, we're talking. Right, and, and right, and the lower courts certainly may not get it right. So you may be in for a long legal battle just because you believe you can, and you probably can. And but you represent these folks, and, and you can't work for free. That's impossible. So <laughs> Somehow don't, I don't do. be the court case. <laughs> right. Just be safe, y'all. Be safe. Yeah, exactly. Um, for sure. Just common sense. Be smart. <laughs> Right. I, I, we need to work a whole lot more together, I think. But um, and we're getting close to getting close to an hour here. Uh, we should probably get Ryan back on the road. Another five hours. I can't believe it. Uh, so, Ryan, tell me, tell me one last time about the the sort of types of education. Sure. I know it's not probably just one flavor, and then how folks can get a hold of you and and sure. Uh, so you you'd mentioned sponsoring education. So obviously uh, we have to charge something because it costs um, us to put it online, to keep that up, to keep the education updated. So anyone out there can actually sponsor the education. What you would do is just go to our website, um, which is www.extract-ed.com. Uh, you can go on there and purchase training. Um, so for 25 bucks, we can purchase um, five online trainings. And then as it goes up, obviously more officers. Um, and then Joni talked about some, you know, some documentation that these guys can get. With each training, we also hand out what's called uh, medical marijuana pocket cards. Um, so that way they fit nicely in a shirt pocket. Uh, when somebody's on the stop, and it's always two or three in the morning, you know that, um, and they can't call and ask somebody, they pull out no the phone pocket friend. card. Exactly. Uh -huh. They pull out the pocket card and they say, oh, okay, they can possess X, Y, and Z back in the pocket. Then basically problem solved. Now, again, that really has to do with sponsoring stuff because, you know, obviously we, we make those, we print those. But anybody out there um, is able to sponsor law enforcement training. And then if you do, what we do is allow you to send um, a message to the officers that are going to receive that. And then you can even uh, pick what area you would like us to send that training. So, for instance, if somebody's from uh, Clay County, uh, you can go in when you purchase it, say, I would like this to go to Clay County Sheriff's Office. We will actually reach out and say we have five uh, certified trainings uh, for you to take online and just hand them over to them with the message from uh, whoever awesome. purchased them. That's so awesome. contact your local dispensary, tell them about it because they're going to want to keep you safe so that you can come patronize their store and everybody can be safe and get what they need and do what they want. I think that's groovy and that's something that maybe your local cultivation business or extractor could sponsor. I mean, why not? It, uh, education's only going to be helpful and if it's, uh, if it's in their interest as well, that'd be a good idea. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, other than that, we do in-person training, but, um, you know, some people are not comfortable with that yet. So if you want in-person training, we can do that as well. But the online stuff is obviously the easiest way to go. We could push it out across the entire state right now, right, if everybody wanted it. Um, but uh, so anyway, that's all I have. If anybody has any questions for me, uh, we're on social media. Um, on Instagram, what is it, extract underscore ed underscore training, or Facebook, which is extracted training, just one word. Uh, you guys can always reach out to me, ask me any sort of questions. I'm not going to guarantee I'll know every single answer, uh, but I will try to answer every question that I get. I get them from law enforcement and from both sides, if you will. So don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Awesome. And Joni? What do we think? I mean, tell us, tell us. You haven't even talked much about the Can of Convict Project. I know, I know. Um, but this is the time. There's, there's never <laughs> enough time to talk about everything we want to talk about. Um, yeah, so I'll just talk touch on a couple of things that I want to mention and so certainly one is I'm working with three nonprofit um, organizations one is Canna Convict Project and the, their mission is to assist nonviolent inmates that are serving time for the plant to be released early um, and so you know trying to help with that you know unfair social you know criminal unjust you know where we've got now it's legal and people are yeah. able to possess and grow and do the exact same things that they may be serving time for or when you hear about those cases where 
somebody got you know 20 years um, for possession or a, and we're, you know we're not talking 20 pounds um, and then we've got these cases you know of uh, you know sexual assaults and things like that that are getting much less time I mean it's just ridiculous it's plant mm -hmm. um, so definitely uh, trying to assist with what we can with Canada Convict Project um, there's a lot of work to do there, but they've already been successful in, in helping uh, some inmates be released early. It's a learning process and getting involved in the post-conviction relief uh, area of law. There's a lot to it, um, but trying to get up to speed on that and assist, and we've got a number of attorneys that uh, are working on that as well as you know other volunteers, and that's all uh, just volunteer at this point. Um, I also am working with Canada Matriarchs, and they do a lot of patient advocacy, great events, raise money for organizations that are helping the cannabis community, and then um, a little bit of work with the Missouri Patients Alliance that's you know trying to assist those denied facility applicants. So all of that is free work at this point, <laughs> but it's, it feels good to be a part of it and try to make a difference. Um, you know, another thing I want to mention that one of the first arguments I made back in December, letters to DHSS, letters to Linda Fraker, letters to general counsel, letters and, 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 you know, a whole campaign of the community, you know, calling out DHSS, calling out the attorney general for some guidance and assistance when these patients are being criminally charged. I think it's more difficult for law enforcement to, you know, on their own with no guidance, decipher the constitutional language and the rules. What is easier, my understanding is, if you have a statute that clearly states it. I had a long conversation with a law enforcement officer about these issues and and how they have to have you have a system where you can look up the law right and you look up the elements why don't we have criminal statutory immunity yet all they have to do is add one word there is multiple statutes and it would create statutory immunity if they would just add the word certify or recommend along with prescribe then it would be just the same as a prescription written by your doctor. Um, one word will give patients uh, statutory immunity. I've made that argument multiple times to all of those departments, hand delivered that uh, legal argument to Lyndall Fraker as well, and I don't understand why we can, uh, we can amend it so that they can get their tax money, but we can't amend it and add one word to create the statutory immunity, which would also help bridge this gap, make law enforcement's job much easier if it's mm -hmm. spelled out and if they would also put in the statute the possession limits. So you have a dead, so everybody would have that dat database instead of your organization after going around and creating your own information for <laughs> all of law, law enforcement. Um, I have come up with, it's just my first run, uh, what I call my patient protection documents, PPE. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Yes. Is that a folder you can like put in your so visor? So it's a vinyl document oh. holder. It's still, I'm, I've got the second edition coming out here okay, next. Okay, okay. But Me too. so I tried to put together information that would be helpful for, to patients. So, you know, the ones that I have right now and I'm handing them out to patients or anyone, I recommend you put your insurance card in there. You got it right there. You, I have a letter from DHSS that is not absolute law, but it is persuasive and it helps give guidance to law enforcement that you know, the important provision says that patients, may, in their opinion, patients may legally possess no matter the source, um, as long as they're okay. within their limits and based on that whole time frame mandated argument of when they had to start issuing those cards. And then in the first one was just on my letterhead of some advice for preparing for successful tra traffic stop. Basically, just keep all this documentation together, accessible in one place, your patient card, your insurance, you be prepared. Um, and then common sense, don't leave things in plain sight. Be discreet, don't smoke a blunt as you're driving down the highway mm -hmm. and filling up your whole vehicle like Cheech and Chong. I love it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, be choosy where you medicate. Um, yes, yeah, store your cannabis ideally in a smell-proof container and ideally, in my advice, in the trunk of your vehicle out of reach. 
And especially if you're traveling with kids, ideally in a locked vehicle or a locked container. Although I would say the whole locked um, container thing is what, as far as whether that can be searched or not, that kind of, it's very dependent. It's not a hard rule. It's not law that law enforcement can't access that without a warrant. So there's just a lot of specific facts to that mm -hmm. incident that, you know, play a role in whether or not that's something that's subject to a search. Um, and be safe. Have your, don't have expired tags. Don't, uh, you know, drive 90 miles an hour in a 60 mile an hour zone. And there was a recent Supreme Court case that came down in January. I have beat some DUIs in the past where the client, you know, crossed the fog line once or twice. That was not enough for many years uh, to create reasonable suspicion for the traffic stop. That changed in January with the U.S. or the Missouri Supreme Court Smith case. Now, crossing that line once, they found that that was enough to pull mm -hmm. you over. So don't be texting and driving with your weed right next to you, no. uh, you know, where you're crossing the line no. and acting like you're driving. Ten and two. <laughs> Eyes on the dashboard. Let's yes. go. Although I also had a client pulled over for, for driving too rigidly and not, <laughs> and not looking <laughs> oh, at no. the, at Say the it ain't officer so. who kept pulling up next Say to him so. for some reason. N you hear me, you folks? Know. This is what an advocate sounds like. Yes. And now, 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 Joni can... When you get version two of that, are you going to let me give away some of those on the show? Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to make a massive order. I actually have a, a number of dispensaries that would like to awesome. carry that in, uh, carry my information in their um, stores, or you know maybe kind of go in on some of the. I think you need it. some of those pocket cards in there too. I do, but so this is going to turn into a card that will easily fit within here, and it's going to have all that advice on it and also have the possession mm -hmm. and purchase limits on the back um, mm -hmm. so that you've got all of that handy. The last section of my advice is when you are interacting with law enforcement, you know, my advice is you don't volunteer information. You can de decline to answer questions. Just do it politely. You know, this, this example would be, um, I would like to remain silent or I'm sorry, officer, I'm not gonna discuss my day. Don't volunteer information because you may be giving them something that's building probable cause or reasonable suspicion to hold you and detain you longer. You also can ask whether you're required to go back and sit in their patrol vehicle if they ask you to. Uh, there was a case that, you know, that found that they weren't required and once they asked, they didn't have to, but People don't know that if the officer says, come back and sit in my patrol car, most people will say, okay. Um, so ask politely if you're required to. The other important thing to do is ask whether you're free to go. I mean, the officer may chat you up trying to get some information out of you and may eventually do that. But he, the stop may have gotten to a point where you are not required to remain there any longer. So you need to regularly ask if you're free to go. In particular, if you've already gotten your ticket or warning or, or you know, whatever it was that the initial stop was for. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and the way I understand it, that's, that's not always typical. Uh, these aren't things that you're going to have to use on a normal traffic stop. But um, you're right, there are cases and there are places where um you know let's just say it's ignorance we need education right sure. so go education we love it uh, we're going to send you guys into a break here real soon stick around i'm coming back in the second half uh, i can see john over here from from taproot ag uh sm smoke a bull singa i love that guy uh, i'm going to try to talk him into participating on this second half we'll see how that goes we're also going to give away some souvenirs don't forget about the happy rock uh, gift certificates that are being given away and the certificates for uh, $50 off a caregiver certification. Uh, love all that. Uh, we're going to actually hear from the Can of Convicts Project here real shortly, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, Clay. yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, that's Eric McSwain right there. Great job uh, moderating this whole thing. Uh, it's just, I'm, I'm just watching this whole thing. It's just so exciting and humbling for me to see, you know, 
there's there's good cops out there, you guys. There's good cops. There's great cops, okay? There's good activists out there. There's great activists out there. And if we could br bridge that gap and bring these people together, bring our communities together with education, with with love, you know, let's there, there's we're we're on the right track, and it's by shows like this here tonight that that says, you know, hey, we can come together as community. We can we can both be educated. We can help each other. I, you know, an activist doesn't mean that you're the guy that's smoking the blunt, rolling down, uh, going 100 miles per hour down the highway like Joni was saying. And, and just like Ryan was saying, you know, the, the cops need certain things that they don't have right now to, to, to do their jobs more actively. So this is just a step in the right direction, you know, bringing people together like tonight. And, and thank you so much for watching. Um, we're gonna have, uh, like like Eric said, an update from Canon Comic Project here. Uh, a couple of commercials. You guys uh, stick around with us. Uh, tag a friend who you think needs to be a part of this conversation. We're, here in a second, we're talking about uh, outdoor harvest, uh, art, outdoor growing and harvesting. Uh, pretty sure that in this next 15 minutes, we can get uh, John Bosinga involved in the next next part of the show. We'll see. We'll try to talk him into it. We didn't know he was going to be here tonight, but he showed up. Uh, so hopefully we're going to pull him on this show. Uh, but uh, uh, tag a friend. Uh, let's uh, take a little break, and uh, we'll see you guys here shortly. Hey, guys. Good evening. Chris and Christina here with the Canon Convict Project. Hope you're enjoying the show. We've got a, a bit of information for you tonight for tonight's update. Uh, so we just want to run through real quick a couple updates with some of the POWs and active cases that are here in Missouri. Um, we're going to start with a couple of upcoming court dates um, that are pending uh, prosecution here in the state for patients. We have Raymond Breer coming up on the 19th of this month. Uh, what's going to happen at his court date, his is a probation violation, and they're going to pretty much decide at this uh, court date if they're going to violate his probation or if they're going to honor his ability to medicate with his uh, medical cannabis here in the state. So uh, we'll be calling out for course, court support. Um, anyone that wants to join us, we would love to have you. The more the merrier. This uh, community is still in need of showing up for one another, so we hope to see you at his court date on the 19th. After that, we have a court date for Aaron and Adela Wisdom on the 25th. There's is going to be a virtual hearing, and it's another um, council status hearing. So uh, send them your love and support and good vibes on for that hearing as well. After that, we have Zachariah Salazar, who we've been following for quite some time. He has uh, finally gotten a pre-trial and a jury trial date set. It's at the beginning of next year. March 12th will be his pre-trial hearing, and then his jury trial will begin on April 4th. So uh, keep up with him and send him your love and support as well for that. He's going to definitely need it. And these are all medical Missouri uh, patients here um, in the state facing active prosecution. Um, next, we want to talk about uh, some of our guys who are in custody who have clemencies pending. We've been um, reoccurring uh, posts about uh, sending them, you know, your support and sending uh, the governor um, your uh, support for their pending clemency as well as the pardons office for those who are on the federal level so you can just go to our page or our group and just copy and paste what we put up there click on the link provided insert that information and hit send and that would be great if you could do that individually for each and every one of them we have Anthony uh, Bearden, Robert Franklin, Trevor Saller, there's Lance Glor up in Washington State. All of them need um, for you to send some information in saying that you do support their pending clemency. Public support really does work. Um, next, we want to talk about Robert Franklin. He is in Moberly, Missouri. He had tested positive for COVID recently. Um, on his second test, he tested negative. He had mild symptoms. Um, so we just want to let you know that he's doing okay. I did recently get approved as a visitor. So as soon as they open visitation back up, I'm very excited to mosey my way out there and visit with him. 
Um, a lot of these guys are suffering from a lot of depression right now. And so anything you can do to send them a letter or put money on their books or whatever you can do to let them know that you are out there and you remember them and they're not forgotten. You know, these long months without friends or family has been devastating to their emotional and mental health. So let's not forget about that. I have no them. idea what just a simple letter or any, any way you're reaching out like that can do for somebody that's in, you know, behind bars. Uh, as far as Zach, who had his federal sentencing at the end of September, he is still in the county. He has not been transferred yet, so we'll keep you posted on that. We're waiting every day uh, to hear that he has been moved to a new location. We want to get him out of county jail because everyone knows those suck worse than prison. And let's get him into a more stable environment that has resources that he can actually use. Um, next, we want to remind everyone Still, if you're not certified, go get certified. Let's give yourself a legal leg to stand on in case you do have any interactions with law enforcement. Um, go get certified. Let's not give them any reason to uh, pursue prosecution on you. I keep hearing so many stories of people getting arrested right now, and <laughs> you can legally possess eight ounces of cannabis on you at any point in time with just your regular medical card. If you're a, a patient cultivator, you can possess up to 12 ounces at any point in time. And there's even, there's even different uh, parts in the law where you can have more than that if you're a caregiver for others. So go get your card, stay protected. Um, you know, it's, it's really just gonna, it's, it's a lot cheaper to get your card than it is to fight a legal battle. Um, we are also working on a really exciting project. If you guys remember our Christmas card project last year where we got the POW's artwork and put them on stock cards with their contact information, bio, picture of them. We're doing something like that again, except it's going to be a little bit bigger. It's going to be a lot bigger. We're really excited about it. We can't really talk too much about it right now since it's still in its collaboration infancy. It's pretty exciting. But it's going to be awesome. So yeah. keep an eye out for that. Um, we also want to remind everyone for the holiday helpings. We have had a lot of community um, of the community reach out to us who are in need of uh, this public support right now. So we have statewide uh, different locations who have collection boxes. This will be running for about two more weeks until we collect all of uh, the canned goods, food goods, monetary donations to start providing Thanksgiving meals for those in need throughout the state. We will be doing this again for Christmas as well. Um, but we're really excited about it. So please donate to the, uh, the cause and stop by these locations go to the Facebook page for holiday helpings there's um, also a link on there for a GoFundMe so you can uh, give money if you want to do that versus dropping off donations and these locations are doing a really great thing by offering discounts to those who donate um, to products within their store so it's it's a win-win if you can donate please donate and in, you know if you if you need help then reach out to us there's no shame here we're you know just trying to help our community and and do the right thing so please donate if you can yes so Aiden's Alliance Rustic Oils Canna Convict Project and Missouri uh, Cannabis Network are all involved with this so reach out to any of us and we'll get you set up um, we also want to say congrats to the dispensaries and cultivators who are up and running and providing medicine to the community we now have, uh, I think, I believe six dispensaries will be opening up um, as of tomorrow. And so there's a, a number of them in the southern portion of the state, some in the Kansas City area and in the St. Louis area. Get out there and, and support your uh, local Missouri cannabis. It's finally here, guys. We want to end by saying thank you to the community for everything that you do. We are so proud of everything that you guys have accomplished individually. There's so many of you who are doing wonderful work and supporting everybody. Um, and I, I'm so grateful. My heart is filled with so much love for you. Thank you. Continue what you're doing. Continue your fight. Um, and... I guess that's it for our update this week, guys. We love you. We'll see you next week. Okay. Ask lots of questions uh, for Joni and Eric and Ryan. Um, and, you know, we're working on our training curriculum, always trying to update it um, on our end. We're trying to get that finalized. We've been meeting about that. 
And if you've got any input on something that you really need more clarification on that you want inserted in these training programs that you're not seeing right now, express that this evening on the chat feed. Reach out to these groups individually. We're always wanting to hear from you. These folks know what they're talking about, so ask away. Um, let's, let's get uh, everybody as informed as possible. Okay. Well, we love you guys. Enjoy the rest of the night. show. Previously on the Evolution Magazine's Home Grow series. We're here at Happy Rock Farms shooting live on Main Street in Kansas City. And tonight we have the largest studio audience here that we've ever had before. Can I get a little applause from the audience right there? You just shake it out. And then you take it using your Happy Rock Farms uh, business card. Wow, they're looking great. The next day they're looking not so great. And you're going... We haven't been spending enough quality time together, have we, dear? <laughs> when you go to actually extract the trichomes off the plant, you're going to use a specific micron screen, and that screen is going to allow the best and the most uh, sought-after trichome off the plant. And I'm going to sign it live for all of you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll leave <laughs> down the computer. Woo! I'll make sure I start. Right. This is the type of signing statement we need more of, all right? What you're going to want to get is obviously some plant material. Industrial hemp is what we have here. That's going to be like five plants in one seed, I'm pretty sure. That's how easy it is to make tea. Oh, so okay, I'm getting excited. excited. Rally towel, rally towel. I'll bring your game. Bring your game, because we got the A++ game here in Kansas City, so... How's everybody doing tonight? I'm Bon Rips McGee. I'm here at the 2021 Canada Festival. We're here with the Dictator of Dank. Mr. Mr. Dictator of Dank and the Microbial Madman. Microbial Madman, what do you got to say to the rest of your competition? They don't know. They don't know? How's, how's your grow going? How's your grow going? They don't know. That's why I'm They don't know. You. I'm hard. I'm okay. hard. They don't know. Hard of hearing. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, we're here with the dictator of Dank. Are you hard of hearing like him? I told you, it's uh, Mister. Sorry, Mister. Dictator of Dank. Uh, what do you got to say to all your uh, competition out there in California? Eat fruit pies and surf, surf more. Stay on the beach, a bunch of hippies. Get out of here. Okay. What about Colorado? They don't know. You live in a big old chili bowl when it snows in the summer. What's that about? You guys are weird. Oklahoma. They don't know. Diet weed, three two weed, just stop, yo, Oklahoma. Ha ha ha. They don't know. Ha. So, uh, what, what know. do you say to your fellow Missouri uh, participants? Look, I'm just gonna say one thing. All right, you see the bottom of my shoes? You see them? Mm -hmm. They're slick. That means I'm not running from no one. All right, nobody. Again, this is a Von Rips McGee. I'm here with the Mr. Dictator of Dank and a Microbial Madman. And then we're at the 2021 Canada. Surf. Canada. Nah. <laughs> All right. Surf beans. They don't know. It's over. The Canada Festival 2021. Surf it's here. Right here. It's the Turk King. Surf beans. The Dictator of the Dank. It's all about the Turk King, baby. They don't know. All right, guys. You guys, uh, you guys heard it here. We're at the 2021 Canafest Nationals uh, with the dictator, Mr. Dictator Dank and the Microbial Madman. And I'm Von Rips McGee. You have a good evening. They don't know. What's up, Evolution family? Thank you for sticking around during that commercial break. Uh, what a great show we've had tonight so far, talking with some uh, some leaders and uh, people that are protecting patient rights and people that are educating our police officers and how we can continue to work together to uh, bring those groups and, and collaborate on making it a safer environment here in Missouri for our uh, patients, for our police officers. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for sticking around. I want to remind you that, uh, please tag a friend, uh, to, to get entered into the $50, uh, gift card from Happy Rock Farms. We are shooting live here from Happy Rock Farms. It's our favorite 
hydroponic store uh, in Missouri because we get to do cool things like this here. So thank you so much to Happy Rock Farms. Uh, $250 gift cards. We're going to give away, tag a friend. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit uh, about some grow advice. We always uh, like to do this, especially from experts like Eric McSwain with MCIA. And then our guest, who we did not expect tonight, John Basinga from Taproot Ag. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, outdoor harvesting and uh, and what you can do with all that. So let's uh, pass it over to those guys. Hey, appreciate it, Clay. Great to be back. Uh love the second half of the show i'm gonna get to show off a little bit we got a, a party crasher here <laughs> love this guy john thanks for hanging out thanks with us my friend me. thanks for, for having sure me. we're we're gonna talk this we're gonna talk nice a little surprise. outdoor you've done that before yeah, right a little bit a little yeah, bit a yeah, couple experience. times yeah <laughs> we're gonna talk about that um i'm gonna have uh whenever james is ready i'm gonna have him call up a video you just saw a little spot having to do with uh the auto growathon that's right. I'm part of Team Happy Rock as well, and I'm going to show off what I got. Uh, and and it's a uh, you know it's interesting. I took a little bit of a different tact with my grow. Uh, what those guys got going, you know, Jonesy and Big V, Fave, all those guys. They you know Ellis. Uh, they they've got some really nice stuff going. But I took a little bit different strategy. Uh, they're auto flowers, and. Uh, in my experience, auto flowers go a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I confirmed this early on with some folks because I've got pretty limited experience. I'm not going to pretend. Yeah. Uh, and I think I got about seven or ten days on the rest of the group. So timeline is tight for this competition. Uh -huh. We're supposed to have everything, you know, dried, cured, sent in um, by middle of December. That's six weeks. That's Christ. six weeks, and a lot of these flowers aren't too far along. Mm -hmm. So hopefully my strategy worked. Eric, I've got your video queued. We're going to try to have you talk over this. Okay? All right. We're going to talk over this video. He's going to throw it up. Hopefully I can see a little bit. I can see what's going on. Yeah, these are my girls. Uh, I've got three little Magic Melon Autos going here. They don't look too bad. If yeah. you see their posture, they look yeah. kind of happy over there. I uh, prefer you have you look at them from a distance because once you get up close, you're going to see a few things going on here. Uh, a little yellowing in the leaves, uh, chlorosis, which is the yellowing turning into necrosis, which is, is leaf death. That's not good. Um, you see a little bit of funniness with the leaves, uh, but they're coming on. I think, I think maybe they're a little bit further along, like I said. Uh, at least I hope so. Uh, but the reason for this is, you know, I'm a live soil grower. So I pack everything I have into the soil. All I've done is add water to this. That's it. A um, little bit of Epsom salt, you know, some, some pest control. Um, but they're in very small pots. And when they get root bound like that, yeah, they're... don't like root bound. No, they don't like to be. But uh, it did seem to bring them into flowering a little earlier. So yeah. buds aren't looking yeah, too look bad. Yeah. Uh, hopefully... You know, if I'm the only one out of 420 that finishes, right. <laughs> uh, well, that's just fine. It was worth the risk. Notice this guy's a polyploid. We got three leaves growing off per node. That ought to make something interesting. But it is also in a, you know, it's got leaf curl up there at the top as well. Uh, she's stressed. She's just in a one gallon, yeah, right? Just a little small. one gallon. Yeah. That's, that's nano whenever you're talking living soil. Yeah, because I'm not pouring nutrients over the top. Right. She's got right. what she's got. Right. Um, it's really small. She's going to struggle a little bit, but hopefully it finishes mm -hmm. up. Hopefully mm -hmm. it turns into mm -hmm. something nice. We'll see. We'll see. That's what's up. It's a good experiment. Different strategy. Yeah, Different right. strategy. That's we'll right. see. It's a competition. Um, so we had our experience this year with autos outdoors. Did you? Just completely do, new with hemp. Uh, haven't done autos before, so really? it was an experience. I mean, it did good. It did really well. Yeah. Um, I, there were a couple of us that that really were happy with the outcome. Some some didn't know what to expect, so sure. they were really surprised at the weight that we got out of it. Good. Uh, so yeah, we're we'll probably going to get next and, year. And yeah. did, I, I'm guessing you sported for quality seed from a quality supplier. Yep. I hear yep. that's key. Is that's that right? That's key. Yeah, that's key. That's mm -hmm. key. And time in. 
Do them in, you know. Yeah. So outdoor, we can run two two harvests maybe, you know, next year. Sure. So that's, sure, uh, that's right. And, and get weight. So that's uh -huh. the big thing. Yeah, it's kind of nice to be bucking in July. Right, right. <laughs> Avoid a little pollination. What buck pollination? In July, you know. What pollination? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's awesome. So, that's awesome. So there's a plus uh, to that. Now, did you go ahead and run two this year? Or did you run photo? We did both. Him? Yeah, did yeah. Uh, uh, grape soda photo and then did some auto flyer, Ricky's Auto. Uh, okay. Both out of Ventura Seed Company. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Awesome. They did really well. Yeah. Good. There's, some, there's some pictures on our website. Um, some really nice, whole arm, nice big colas. You yeah. Know, really nice. Ooh. Nice, nice structure. Oh, yeah. I love yeah. that. I was real happy with it. Love that. And yeah. but I guess that helped with your manpower as well, having that sort of two cycle harvest. Well, we didn't do two cycle this year. We okay. ran them in late. We put them in late okay. with the photos. Um, so gotcha. they were in the same field with the photos, but uh, okay. we ran them in late. And okay. so they finish same time or roughly they're in. Yeah. But next year we're going to plan a little bit earlier and yeah. work on that two stage. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. That's, so that's awesome. It's pretty interesting. That's yeah. awesome. Well, and, and so <sighs> I agreed. I'm, I'm a caregiver. So uh, I wanted to go out door with my medical plot this year, but I had to be sure I talked to the patients as well because you can't just move yourself. You have to move the whole little outfit that, you know, it kind of gets kind of wrinkly and complicated. Uh, work with DHSS on that. But I also wanted to talk to them because outdoors, um, you know, we're at the mercy of Mother Nature. No, oh, yeah. Right? So I mean, much. this year. <laughs> so many this, variables. This year yeah. was kind of moldy. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, CD, we had lots of pollen. Yeah. A lot of wild pollen flying yep. around. So, yep. you know, nice to see some some good looking bud from outdoors. Yeah, that's not for sure. Up. For sure. And <laughs> so that's what I'm showing you. I talked to yeah. my patients and, you know, uh, we ended up losing like 20%, 25% of the crop to mold. Mm -hmm. Right, those got mm -hmm. pitched out. Mm -hmm. We had 18 different varieties out because being our first year, full year outdoor, we didn't know. So yep. I wanted to experiment yep. with a lot of varieties. Um, discuss that with the patients as well. Mm -hmm. We all kind of rolled the dice and, mm -hmm. and made some choices. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm gonna show you tonight are some varieties that worked for me. Uh, where I got them from, exactly what variety they are, uh, that sort of thing because there's something about these that happened to work in Missouri. Uh, all of these were mold free, turned out high quality, 20s are up THC, uh, some had some CBD in it as well. Um, and you know, despite the fact we lost 20 to mold and the mold problems this year, these guys all come through unscathed. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna tell you about the ones that didn't work, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's <laughs> some it, it's a very small sampling that I did and it may just be a phenotype mm -hmm. that I got mm -hmm. that didn't take, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Very limited, so I'm, I don't mm -hmm. wanna trash talk anybody, mm -hmm. but I do wanna say something that did work out. It won't work out every time, your mileage is gonna vary, every year's different, um, but I think given our tolerances this year, um, these might be some good choices for next year, mm -hmm. okay? Take that with a grain of salt though. Uh, also know that I like to dry farm. It's kind of a trendy new term that means that I don't irrigate. Uh, it was also a new bed. So there was a lot of stress because of soil compaction, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't the best soil in the world. We got a lot of deadpan mm -hmm. clay where mm -hmm. I am. And, and in Missouri, by the way, we have dozens of different types of soil. Lots of different soil. Yeah, <laughs> that's the first thing, get a soil sample if you're gonna go direct soil. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I wanna or get into drill that holes too. and go with like the living soil, right? you know, and just right? do living soil in a nice three gallon or, you know, good 24 inch diameter. Yeah. Post hole, yep. that'll work too. Yep, and but yeah. you got to have drainage on it. But you got to have drainage. Otherwise, it turns have, into a pond. Exactly, right? you cannot have a flat area. Yeah, That's no right. Wet feet. That's right. And yeah. I, I had so some back to the pan and the hard wall sides. Mm -hmm. You know that'll that'll cut into your root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where I live, you can make a pond with a footprint. Yeah. you know what I mean. So <laughs> right. you don't need to do a lot of work to put right. in a pond. Right. So, so your organic matter is a uh, crucial. Yeah, where big, you're deal. At. yeah. big deal. Big yeah. deal. I'm really looking forward to like year two and three when I really start to to build that whole bed up. up. Yeah. 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 Um, so at any rate, let's let's show you some of these that I've got here. Um, Orange Gasm was probably my surprise of the year. Um, these are outdoor. Um, I don't trim all that great. Got arthritis. Don't care for it. I'll knock knock the sugar leaves off right before I twist one up or whatever I'm going to do. Orange Gasm was a surprise because I've grown it indoor uh, in medical before we moved outdoor, and it 
you know, is is really good when we got to a finished product, mm -hmm. but it seemed to be a little sensitive to botrytis. Mm -hmm. Bud rot, mm -hmm. the indoor buds mm -hmm. were just solid and big. It's a platinum tangy golden goat cross, you know, so you got some just some really nice buds, but they're so tight and it's just sensitive to mold. Mm -hmm. I figured there was no way outside. Mm -hmm. But as it turned out, when I grew them outside, and you can almost see here, um, the buds are a lot fluffier yeah. than what you'd expect yeah. inside. You know, whenever you push on these, they're going to be spongy mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to being just really hard. So I think maybe that allowed more airflow, mm -hmm. whatever Did the case may be. Yeah, yeah whatever, yeah. you know, it expressed differently outside. Mm -hmm. Big surprise, didn't get a lot of mold, uh, turned into some real nice medicine at the end. Uh, one of my patients, uh, they already have theirs. Uh, didn't want to go get some and bring it. It's not mine to show. Uh, they grew from Irie Genetics. They also grew the Morning Dew, uh, which did quite well outside. Orange Gasm, just like you think. Uh, it's got some orange to it. Um, Morning Dew is a little more foot funk, mm -hmm. you know, classic mm -hmm. sort of skunk. Mm -hmm. uh, I also grew some Humboldt Dream that did really well outside. Not really like Humboldt Seed Company. Um, Mostly because what I see in the descriptions of their seeds end up being accurate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they do a good job good germination describing. rates, good good description. Yeah, that's yep. right. And so, just you know, true to advertising, it did well outside mm -hmm. and high good. humidity. Yeah, this here looks really good, and a lot denser than I thought yeah. it would be. Turned out really good. Yeah, it's got a lot of a mm -hmm. lot of good coverage. It's in the mid twenties as well. Mm -hmm. Um, really just as advertised uh, and again unless you know a limb might have damage or something during a storm and then it might get a little rot it might get a little mold right. mm -hmm. you know because it's weak it's damaged so mm -hmm. but apart from those damaged um, I didn't see any pests or mold on the, and the mold dream. we found on the outdoor not to interrupt before mm -hmm. you know the other strains right but there is a there is a um, cannabis specific mold that we have in the state that oh. is that is um, it's being researched this year by by the uh, MU Ag Research Facility as well as K State. So it's something that we've discovered this year that's been I don't want to say dormant in the soil in Missouri, mm -hmm. but we've activated it. Oh. Uh, thanks to guys like us that are out there growing outdoor, we're finding out some of these fungus and some of these uh, fungicides that have been used and gone dormant. And it's, it's been interesting what we're finding out and using the ag research programs to explore yeah. it some more. No doubt. So and we'll know more next year. And, you, and you're, you're fairly limited on the genetics and mm -hmm. seeds that you can use on the hemp side, especially, right? Right, right. And we can't push as far as you can. So you know, I'm not pushing for THC. So I have to pull early. And mine might be a little, I don't want to call that larfy but you know a little bit loosey yeah. loose and airy yeah. um we might have that just because we've got to pull early uh yeah. indoor i've got to pull uh sampling at week six so I'm, I'm harvesting at week eight i don't have a full expression of the plant by week eight really yeah it's, no, ten, it's, it's 10 you know is it's when true. i get a good expression of the plant yep. but my thc is so high my cbd is tolerable it's time to harvest yep so Yep. Yeah. No, that's yeah. And, so we're finding a lot out outdoor. Timing. Yeah, it's timing. It's timing. It's, it's timing. timing. So yeah, but like moving into this bud. This is a nice bud. Uh -huh. uh, I like this blue. Yep. Um, you know, it looks like it did really well. Yeah, this one came out of the uh, the Starling collection. Ricky Starling, you out there? Hope you are. Should be Missouri Cannabis Network. Yeah. The Cannabis Network. That's right. <clears throat> now, pay attention real close. Tag a friend who wants to talk outdoor. We're going to be here for a little bit yet. Ask some questions. Tag that friend because we're, compliments of Ricky, going to give away a pack of seeds for the Blue Tangy cross and the Los Federanos cross. Okay, both crossed in with the Pineapple Skunk Black Black Lime Reserve. We're giving away a pack of those seeds tonight. Cool. Tag a friend. Come on. Come on. I, I was real impressed. Uh, I hooked up with Ricky on these. Uh, he wanted to test them out to make sure it was even good to give away, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is pretty responsible in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a patient said, yeah, you know, bring it on. Uh, let's give it a try. We did. We liked it indoors, and we're like, well, let's run it outdoors yeah. too. See what's going on. Isn't it on. interesting the different expression you get between indoor it, and outdoors? They were. It's they were. Different. I mean, this one expressed yeah. with CBD outside yeah. and not inside. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Exact same. I mean, it was a it was That's a really clone. Cool. You yeah. know. So, uh, anyway, I was pretty impressed with the the blue tangy cross. Um, this one's in the upper 20s. Uh, I've had a couple indoors run 30, 31 in terms of THC, mm -hmm. which is really yeah, high. That's high. Uh, it's skunky. Um, you can't really get a lot of blue out of most of them, although a couple of them do turn into a little bit more fruit. Uh, but outside, it was really just flawless. 
uh, covered covered in trichomes. Uh, it's got the potency. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, I can't say can't say anything bad about it. No, looks good. Yeah, not bad, not bad, not you know they're not it super it, dense, but right? you know that's a, that's a problem we had out outdoor as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, some plants we're helping on another farm right now. Shout out to Mocal Farms. Uh, and Weston, we're helping do their harvest, and uh, we're bucking some of their bud right now, and it's really nice, dense bud. Yeah. Uh, they utilize one of the tobacco barns in that Platte County area oh. to slow dry cure their product. Sure. Wow, nice. works really good. Nice. Tighten it up, made the aroma come out. Uh, yeah. Really, really nice. Yeah. And so a bud like that, you know, that typically you would spend time curing. This barn did the trick. Yep. Ten, ten, yep. ten to fourteen days. Yeah, no, and it's that's key. I mean, you don't want to go more than 14, especially right. 21, because then... Well, we lower moisture content. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could have brought in a moisture meter. We could check the moisture and, you know, 6%, 10% moisture content. Now we can't get it off the stem without it just exploding. Yep. So it's got to be the right moisture content to preserve that tight bud. Yep. But not, yeah. not too wet. Now not too got, wet. Now you got mold again. Now you got mold again. Oh, yeah, exactly. Man, it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. But sometimes yeah. low tech's amazing, too. Yeah. Uh, especially if you get some good weather. Now, whenever you're doing harvest, you have to pay real close attention to the THC percentage. Do you yeah. you use any kind of field testing, testing devices? We send out, no. Okay. We send out to a DEA-approved lab in Chattanooga. Okay. Um, there's some labs in town uh, that we can use for just THC potency testing, but when it comes to our compliance testing, we use DEA-approved lab. Yep. So that's yep. that's a new bloom in Chattanooga. Yep. They Makes do a sense. really good job, fast turnaround. Um, confident cannabis software, so it's very quick to get your your uh, COAs, um, everything we need for sales for our, our patients. So good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So I, we have to stay on that. Yeah. Yeah. We really definitely. Have to stay on that. And and because you don't want to test hot, you nope. can lose a whole crop lose that way. Lose the last three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, and all the money man. and time. And it's yeah. se seasonal work anyway. So What's, yeah, I use uh, I use a purple scientific tester. Oh, okay. A little purple box. Uh, I found it works pretty good. I've matched it up with some lab result, results. It gets me right in the neighborhood. It's just THC and CBD. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's got a, a margin of error of two percent, which is too much for what you're doing. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you want margins yeah. of error yeah. that are tiny. Super tight. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, but it, it does pretty good. I've also heard good things. I think here in town, um, Manus Nine has Gamma Cert. Okay. That they do for their folks, and yeah. and it works out pretty yeah. well. Uh, those are both pretty expensive units, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they really are. So I would suggest getting with your local stores like Happy Rock here and saying, "Hey, I'd like to see this happen." And the more people that walk in the door and ask that sort of thing, pretty soon they're going to have a tester on hand. Yeah, that would be helpful. And be able to help yeah. you out yeah. um, because that that's a big buy for mm -hmm. one person. It was for me. My wife's like, "You better get out there and charge five bucks a test or something, right, you know, right, to, right, to help right. out with this." So right. yeah. um, that's how I came. Yeah, because I don't it. think you're. I don't think the medical patient could send to the labs that we send to. Uh, for the potency not, testing. Not the DEA labs. Right? Not the not DEA, DEA labs. labs. Yeah. Now, yeah, especially I, out of state. You're not sending no, any flower out of state. Mm, mm, so, yeah, exactly. That's so. right. And uh, I've talked to a few folks here, a few of the labs here, a uh, couple that haven't opened yet, and um, they want to serve home growers. Uh, I just haven't heard that they're actually going to do it mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or when that's going to happen. But I'm going to keep working towards that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully hopefully they can do it. If nothing else, I'd like to see our caregivers for our caregiver program mm -hmm. do safety testing in addition to the potency mm -hmm. testing mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's... Um, a lot of patients are going to be for that and willing to pay a couple extra bucks for it. Uh, so why not Why not go get it why done? Why not offer it? Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, we have to do a full panel test, really. I mean, a COA gets the product sold, but really to show the client or the, the patient the transparency of the product, the full panel is, is where that sure. comes in. Sure. We show the very low pass points of all the heavy metals and pesticides and herbicides and all the things that we did not use. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, very organic. <laughs> so yeah. if it pops yeah. on the test, you're yeah. like, well, well, don't want to sell it. Yeah, I mean, you, you have a moral obligation, what right? Yeah, no, exactly. it's no doubt because yeah. it's. Medicine. And we've had that happen. Uh, something popped on a test recently of a client of mine, and 
had no idea how that happened. Had to think back how that happened. Well, it was some contaminated gloves touched the product. Uh, so send in a retest. But that sent levels of a metal that we didn't think we had. You yep. know, so it was, yep. it was pretty it doesn't, doesn't take pretty much. No. But that, that's good for the patient. I yep. mean, it give you some peace mm -hmm. of mind. Mm -hmm. And it's the strength of the legal market. You yep. know, it's exciting. We got yeah. dispensaries yeah. opening. Yeah. Come on, right. guys, in Missouri. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I didn't think I'd be growing 18 flowering plants at home either, but... Yeah. Anyway, um, so outdoors this year, the last one, also from the Starling Collection. This is the other seed pack we're giving away. Tag that friend, come on. Um, this one has the Los Veteranos cross with the Pineapple Skunk Black Lime Reserve. And it was, it came out with two really different phenotypes from a pack of six. Uh, they're regular seeds, so we had some males in there too. But the leaves on it were huge. Uh, one of the phenos did have a little bit sort of an aphid thing going in the middle of the year, but never hurt the plant. They went away pretty quick. You know, somebody mm -hmm. came by and got them, uh, and they finished nice, no mold whatsoever this year. Uh, I was real impressed. And, and again, I'm, I dry farm. I don't irrigate, mm -hmm. so there's going to be drought stress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There was a couple times they were bent over. I really, I was yeah. getting the hose Pissed out off. when it started <laughs> raining, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then in the spring, it was really wet. Right, it was wet until early yeah, June this yeah, last year, which spring. was stressful for the plants. But despite all that stress, they still did um, surprisingly well, all things considered. And yeah. even though we threw away so much of our harvest, uh, we got to pick and choose some of the best uh, of the buds to fulfill our possession limit, right? I mean, that was our limiting factor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. despite losing uh, so many plants. But here you see a representation, you know, only eight of 18 plants am I recommending based on last year's grow. So that's just an indication of, um, you know, the struggles of outdoor cultivating. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's a lot of fun. I also didn't use uh, any pesticides or treatments of any sort. So uh, literally all I did was watch them, tend them, take notes on them all year. Really? Okay. Because I wanted a true, true, true test. Mm -hmm. Right, my, my control yeah. was my soil and the weather yeah. this year. Yeah. I didn't, you know, hey, I got eight varieties here that thrived last year despite mm -hmm. Mother mm -hmm. Nature, right. and I didn't oh, have to help them. Yeah, there are I didn't challenges. even have to help them. Now, <laughs> that's do impressive. Have, do you have yeah. to help yeah. help the hemp crops? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. what kind if of I, help do you give well, them? Well, right off the bat, as soon as we throw the plants in the ground, the grasshoppers just annihilate them. Mm. Grasshoppers, Japanese beetles, uh, then you can get hit with russet mites, aphids. Um, spider mites can always be a concern. Um, so all your standard cannabis attackers, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the grasshoppers early on and the, and the beetles. So we use a product called Debug. Uh, Debug works great from start to finish, and it's uh, it's organic. It's on the list of certified products that we can use. Um, hemp were restricted to a certain list off the EPA, and so yeah, we'll, we'll use that product to defend them. Um, but really, we only do it when we see the problem. You know, sure. we see ladybugs, we see praying mantis, we see all the naturals. Mm -hmm. You know, in the in the mm -hmm. field. That's the encouragement. Uh, if you have a chance to incorporate chickens uh, when you first plant, mm -hmm. that's a really helpful, mm -hmm. uh, beneficial. Guinea hens are better. Uh, just saying, they're hard to keep, but <laughs> they won't peck your plant. They'll just get. Well, the, that's it. They'll just get the bug. The, you the know, chicken they don't might check take your, a peck out of yeah, the plant. Yeah. Anyway. And so then, yeah, you've I've got your natural that defense that works really good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true, and that's true of the the Los Veteranos. Um, you know, along about late June, I saw that it had the classic trail of aphids up the mm -hmm, stem, mm -hmm. you know, and the ants shepherded mm -hmm. them and the whole deal. They were just happy as could mm. be. And I thought, boy, I ought to just kind of <laughs> get in there and uh, give it to yeah. them. But let's, you know, let's see how the plant does. And, and I'm glad I did because within about two and a half weeks, I saw some ladybugs stop through, yeah. saw some wheel yeah. bugs stop through. Yeah. You know, I started seeing these predators on the mm -hmm. plants and pretty soon the aphids and the ants were gone. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Off yeah. you went and finished. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes yeah, you get lucky, sometimes but you get lucky. but some of that I think has to do, in my case, with the genetics because mm -hmm. they didn't have mm -hmm. a lot going for them mm -hmm. other than the genetics. Resilient. I yeah. didn't really help them at yeah. all. So so these these are my That's my good. recommendations for the year. Uh, hopefully somebody gets in on those free souvenirs we're handing out. Uh, we also hey, if you got any question, guys, if anybody wants to go outdoor next year. You've got a couple of guys that have grown outdoors before, so ask us a questions. 
Um, now, whenever you go out with your hemp, yeah. do you use pure seed or do you go clone with some of those? I've done both. Um, yeah. When the mar- when we first started, uh, the first company I have in Colorado, Elevate Hemp, we started in 2016. Everything was done with clones. Mm-hmm. You couldn't afford to buy seed. It was f- it was five ten dollars a seed, just like our cannabis seed for medical. Okay. Um, but the market has shifted quite a bit, considerably Good. gone below a dollar a seed. Uh, last year we hit a dollar a seed. Now I'm sure we're going to be below. If you buy year. early. If you buy early, you got to secure it early. Um, So you lock into your supplier early, usually between now and March, and you'll get the best deal. Um, But now we're getting to the point where we will start the seeds. We'll do seed starter transplants. Ah. So it's a more robust plant, a better tap root, if you will, out of that seed. Feminized seed. Feminized seed. We use feminized seed. Um, I do have suppliers that do uh, mixed seed, so we do have that option. Mm -hmm. Um, But typically the farm will go with feminized starters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went. Clones are not out of the. I went with about six different autos, auto flowers. I went with um, six that were regular. Mm-hmm. Um, got lucky uh, mm-hmm. with the females that I got out of those. And then I went with six from cuts. Um, and these were cuts, like I said, the Humboldt Dream and Orange Gasm that I keep indoor for my patients. And also this uh, version, this blue, tan- blue Tangy Cross, a patient really likes from indoors. Brought those out as cuts. Uh, I do it in early June. So that Mm -hmm. when they come outside, they go, ah, the different light. (laughs) And by the time, it takes them a couple weeks to transition to Mm -hmm. flowering. And then all of a sudden you're on, you know, June 21st Mm -hmm. and the nights start getting longer. Mm -hmm. So the plant's like, oh yeah, this is cool. This this is fall. Plants are, nights are getting longer. Mm -hmm. So it stayed in flowering and that may have helped these uh, Mm -hmm. finish early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had all of these out by the last week in September. Interesting. Um, and if you look at them, they've got, they're about um, 95% cloudy, just a few clear, mm-hmm. a few amber. On Any idea side what of weight you ended up with per plant? Just um, rough guess? You know, the, the good plants, the, the, the from clone plants were about three ounces a piece. You know, they didn't get too big because uh, they, they flowered right away. Mm-hmm. They didn't have a big root base. They, they went to flower. Mm-hmm. Uh, it helped them get out early. These tend to finish just a little bit longer. Um, for the from seed plants, it was closer to about a pound. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, now, we didn't keep all that. It's right. against the rules. Right. Right. Okay. It's against the rules. Like, yeah, you know, we, I know, we, I know you we only dest- kept your allotted. That's but right. Just curious we what destroyed the plant all the perform. West with fire. Right. Okay. <laughs> Destroy it with fire. Okay. So, um, the, but I think the mix, it depends on what you got. If you've got something that works indoor and outdoor, like these guys are going to be keepers for me now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can just keep them all year round. And then next year, I know that I should get pretty similar results, even on a wet year like mm-hmm. we had this year, mm-hmm. um, which is, this is was real a tough comforting. Year. This was yeah. a tough year. I've been gone for four years in Colorado and come back ready to grow last year. And was excited to get outdoor. And then this year was like, holy crap, we just got pounded with rain. Mm. We had lost half of our field in Stanbury oh. and, you know, just had problem after problem. Oh, so no. hopefully next year we have a dry year and you right. blow out your outdoor and right. everybody's it. successful. Yeah, Crush exactly. Crush it. That's right. I'd like right. to see this really uh, do well next year. Yeah, for sure. And and so for folks that want to go outdoors, now is the perfect time to prepare. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you do you do any preparation Absolutely. in your plots this yep. time of year? Absolutely. What do you do? Absolutely. Right now is the time. Right now is the time mm-hmm. to to add your amendments uh, to prep for for the season. Because mm-hmm. uh, what's going to happen is that soil is going to freeze, and then all the microbial activity does what it does below surface layer yep. through the winter. Uh, That's they'll right. Go through its feet, freeze and thaw state, and then next spring we'll add what we have to to get ready and. Off you go. We'll be in the ground by late May, early June. Off you yeah, go. Off That's you go. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got my plot. Repeat. Just repeat. I, I found a supplier who gave me three yards of rice holes. Mm-hmm. So really well. threw yeah. those rice holes yeah. in there, chewed it up, threw some extra, you know, a yard or two of compost. Mm-hmm. It's a 25 by 25 plot. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, threw it all in there. I'm basically trying to make it all one huge raised bed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by doing, they can get deep into the clay as well, or, you know, as deep as they can in the clay and survive those droughts, mm-hmm. uh, become drought tolerant in that way. Uh, so next year, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, you know, hopefully it's a real tough choice mm-hmm. on, boy, what, what 12 ounces do I keep? Right. I mean, right, holy smoke. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, and uh, I like to cover mine up because it's a smaller plot. I'm mm-hmm. not talking commercial hemp. Um, I cover mine up with straw. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw <laughs> animal feed on top, alfalfa. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's pure, no preservatives. Alfalfa and oats and cracked corn. Just throw it right on top. It'll feed your worms. Mm -hmm. Worms will come right up and get it, cover it with straw. Don't uncover it except to plant your hole. And your roots will spread out right under that straw. It'll stay moist. Just keep Fine. adding to the top after that. And hopefully... Uh, you know, this is second year. That's why I did the till mm -hmm. again on the second mm -hmm. year. Hopefully after this year, it'll be leavened up enough, mm -hmm. loose enough that the worms can get in and do their thing and I can go no-till. Because once you do that, then the theory is um, those worms are making holes mm -hmm. and routes for water to drain out and through. Mm -hmm. um, it creates air, pulls air down into the soil. And when you till, then you get rid of all that. Right. You get rid of the microbial the networks. Microbial and network that's within that first Fungal networks. Soil you yeah. bet. You yeah. bet. You crush it every time. So mm -hmm. we'll see. We'll mm -hmm. see. Next year, mm -hmm. I'll mm -hmm. hopefully I'll come when I'll have like 18 different ones and I'll, hey, but. We'll soil see. samples, you can always get a soil sample. Mm -hmm. um, soil samples are great to do. Uh, they're super cheap, um, fast response. We, we use a company out of Omaha. Mm -hmm. um, been using them for years and yep. yeah, getting your organic matter right. But now's the time to get that soil sample. Do those amendments yes. to get ready through, this, through the yes. winter. You can get your pH adjusted, you can do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You bet, That's, this mm -hmm. is the perfect time. And, and by letting it rest all winter too, you're really letting, uh, you know, that gives months, which is, eons in terms of uh, the microbes in the soil because they reproduce fast you could you know you could even plant in a, uh, a cover crop like mm -hmm. uh, radishes sure. uh, if you want to really break your soil up plant radishes and that radish will expand and then just leave the radishes in the, in the soil yep. and it will destroy and and break down inside yep. that soil and leave you a nice loomy you nutrient bet. soil you bet yeah, yeah and and even, I guess, if you were to put in some sort of, you know, maybe a Dutch clover, mm -hmm. short clover, yep. anything yep. that's going to make, it makes uh, a bunch of holes in rye, the soil. Uh, yeah. Cereal rye works really good in the winter. It'll destroy all your uh, weed activity yep. and keep all your under uh, microbial active. Yep. So and really each good. one of those yep. little plants puts a little root in the soil, a little root mass. Mm -hmm. And when it rains, it hits the plants, it hits those roots and goes right into the soil. Uh, that way it doesn't beat up on top. You've seen agricultural land that's been tilled and cultivated. It's compacted it's now. It's pulverized. pulverized. Yeah. Rain hits it. They say it off. looks great. It's black dirt. It's, oh, it's like coffee grounds. And I get down there and I'm like, uh, I don't think so. So uh, sorry. So, so, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Not, not going to work. Once yeah, that's it. it. There's just too much you have to add to it. It's like in Colorado, we had to feed the soil constantly. And I thought we had to prep for that here. You know, coming home, knowing that we have clay soils and and uh, spongy absorbent soils you know good mm -hmm. organic matter still had planned our feed regimen based off what we've been doing for four years mm -hmm. having compost tea tanks and having boom sprayers ready and all that put the plants in the the fields prepped the rain came nobody did a thing three pound plants <laughs> you know, I was like nice thank you hopefully this is great. I'm, this ho is I'm hoping to be soil, there next baby. year I'm yeah. hoping to be there next <laughs> exactly, year yeah. now that I'm prepared that's right <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah, Talk about tough awesome. fall choices yeah. for a home yeah. grower there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love right, it. Right, right, um, right. Yeah, and so I, I guess another thing that I like to do in in the fall, you know, you get the oil, the soil test, which I think mm -hmm. is really important, and, and have somebody read it who knows how to read mm -hmm. it. Uh, a lot of these companies will do the test and sort of give you an analysis of what you might think about adding. And gear it towards cannabis. Right. You know, that's the other thing is they don't really know when they read it what crop you're putting in because they've yep. never really amended for cannabis before. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. close to corn. It's really close to corn. Yep. And you have to remember, too, that, you know, when the cannabis grows, and especially cannabis, it's a bioaccumulator. It's going to suck out all kinds of stuff out of the soil. Uh, whenever you take that material home and show it off on a table or whatever you do with it, this is stuff that used to exist in the ground. Mm -hmm. It's all made out of the stuff that was in the ground. So you have to put the stuff back in the ground. You have to replenish. Just, just all there is to it. So every year you're gonna have to do something. Uh, do it early. Do it in the fall. If you do it in the spring, um, especially if you're talking blood meal, bone meal, those sorts of things, where you're gonna get critters in it. It's gonna be so much fun. They're gonna be digging around in your stuff. You're gonna be thrilled. It's gonna be awesome. Hashtag sarcasm. Okay. Um, but. Uh, so anyway, uh, another thing that your outdoor home growers are going to have to think about is the restrictions on it from the state. Uh, you have to be in an enclosed facility, and outdoors a facility is defined as something that's locked, 16 gauge, uh, chain link fence uh, is suggested. It has to be affixed to the ground. 
Um, so, so in other words, you can't just be a dog kennel set setup. Up. You, you actually have to maybe put in T-posts, okay. right, and affix it to the T-posts. Uh, and then it can't be accessible from the top. Now, of course, the safest way to accomplish that is to enclose it a la greenhouse, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. I don't like that because I like for the it to be self-watering, yeah. you know, yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, your bugs are going to be a bigger problem under roof because mm -hmm. there's no rain to wash them off. Mm -hmm. Rain's a big helper in that, that category. Um, so you have to make it inaccessible. Now I and other folks I've known have made it inaccessible with maybe a double strand of barbed wire okay. at the top. Okay, uh, even on a six foot fence. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I see barbed wire and, I'm, and I'm Jack the Ripper, you <laughs> know what I mean? Barbed wire. <laughs> I'm going to go get some bolt cutters and go through the chain. There's leak. something in there. Not going to fool with all that pokey stuff up <laughs> right. there. Um, and that, that's that's the consensus that I've seen yeah, from the department as well. Um, and of course, you can't you can't have it visible. Plus you from, can't see it visible, right? No nope, second story. No, yeah, yeah, can't be yeah. visible from a second that's a story that's a anywhere around. You got to you know really. Uh, do your best. If you're renting, you got to get permission. It's a good idea. Uh, for most folks who can't have an in-ground plot, you're probably going to go containers. Perfectly fine. No problem. Some of the most humongous plants mm -hmm. I've seen in my life, cannabis plants, were grown with container-type soil, you know, a mm -hmm. manufactured soil, um, right outside. <laughs> Amazing. But you're going to have to irrigate them. You're going to have to stay on it. Mm -hmm. They're going to dry out within a day in August, yeah. and they're going to get sad oh, on yeah. you. Then they're going to get the bugs and all that mm -hmm. sort of nonsense. You, you really have to think about uh, irrigation in those cases. I like to go on vacation. So I'm, I'm, you get to go on vacation I'm a, and I'm you gonna, grow? How I'm do you gonna, do that? Because I'm, I'm a dry farmer. I don't irrigate. So um, <laughs> it works. Figure it that works. out. Well, you just need somebody. Just <laughs> right. go check on that for me. I'll right. be in Vegas. Be right back. I have to worry. I'll have to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Good deal. So, uh, any other tips from you? Oh my gosh. I'd... Well, I'm think I'm thinking odor is going to be an issue. That's odor is an issue. That's something you got to think about outside, even in him. Right? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Too. Joni mentioned it earlier. They were talking about the training. Um, no yeah, odor problem. Yeah, That's right. No odor problem. No odor. That's right. Harsh I mean, got us on that. Exactly. One. And you know, and, and since we did our training, I actually had another interaction with the Platte County Sheriff's okay. Department's Narcotics Division because of the odor. We got an odor call. Oh. I'm helping. Now was it an active field? Oh, it was harvest. No, it's harvest. We've got oh, tobacco barns full of plants, that's and stinks. it just reeks. Do you get terpene headaches? Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, me too. Uh, uh, how do you say that, Jeremy? Yeah, I forget. Beta caryophylline. <laughs> so do it. it's the beta caryophylline that the plant puts off that actually well, makes yeah. your eyes tear up and can cough and uh, irritable skin and all that. You so bet. through our helpers, we've learned different people who have different irritations uh, from this beta caryophylline. And that's why I laugh about Jeremy uh, JT, who owns is part of the owner of Mocal Farms. Uh -huh. He's a character. Uh, he and I have just <laughs> had a blast this season, and so that's he's hopping around like a character beta caryophylline, you know. <laughs> He learned a new word. Yeah, I learned a new word, and now I can't forget it, thanks to Jeremy. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, – no, but we're, we're running 20-foot-long panels. Uh, they're basically fences that are hung in the sky uh, that we've loaded, um, like ceiling tile. And the officer smelled it at least a mile away when he came to do the investigation and it was called on by somebody passing by and it was pungent i mean it was very very strong there's a lot of hemp you know we're pulling out of there yes, and so i see a sheriff drive by see sheriff drive by again see sheriff drive by again i'm on the phone with my partner i said i my business partner i said i gotta let you go chris but i've got a cuss i've got a, a stop that's getting ready to happen i can just feel it then the phone rings sure enough there's the narcotics agent that we've been talking to and he pulls in right as the phone's ringing i was like hey hi how are you detective and uh, do you mind if we take a look around and so we did the full tour you know back to the transparency and bridging that gap mm -hmm. he said oh my gosh i can't believe this you know he's standing in the middle of it i've chased this for decades and here we are in a legal harvest you know that just reeks i mean it just <laughs> it does <laughs> it was so it, not, it pungent. reeks to the point it hurts oh it's horrible it hurts it, so it's, it's so great it hurts you know so good. i pulled in today to it check on the crew i was like oh it smells so good let's get this in buckets come on it's please, time yeah, please. yeah that's what i do too so we got do about you, a week we'll be pulling buckets? it yeah we use um well there's a few transfer methods because of the mm -hmm. locations of where we're at so what the processor wants is yard sacks the the mm -hmm. big uh, cubic yard sacks yep 
Yeah. So to get them to the cubic yard sack that can be loaded with a forklift, they're transported in 45-gallon uh, Tupperware tubs, you know, ah. the, the travel totes or whatever. Yep. Yep. So And we can we can cure them in there and kind of do the post-process or sure. pre-process, however you want to put it, post-harvest, um, to prep it, to get the terpene profile up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. So, so yep. a lot of tubs. Yep. That's, <laughs> a lot of tubs. That's similar to what but I do. But we move them off-site immediately. I mean, as soon as we get them bucked, you know, that's the commodity. So yeah, the commodity has to leave. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yep, it's true. And, and at home too, you, you really have to think ahead if you're going to grow outside, you know, you've got your spot mm-hmm. and we talked about getting your soil planting. ready. Yeah. And, but whenever you go to harvest, especially if you're dry. an indoor yeah. grower, what are you going to do with Where it? Where are you going to dry? <laughs> what are you going to do with it? Because if you take it inside yeah. to your indoor grow, guess what? You just brought in aphids, you brought in spider yeah. mites, yeah. you brought in All everybody, inside, you yeah. brought in their cousins, mm-hmm. you brought, I mean, it's it's going to be an issue. Yeah. So you really have to think ahead. There's a few things. I like to do a dip. Uh, again, we're talking about small, small compared to, you know, commercial hemp. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll actually do a water dip. Uh, really? Okay. If, if I see bugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm also going to do a lemon juice dip before I do the pure water dip. So the pure water dips always last. It's a rinse. Uh, if I think I'm going to take in mold, mm-hmm. which is pretty certain, I'll probably do some peroxide. peroxide yeah. So now you're talking three big barrels. Boom, 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 boom. It's a big pain in the butt. Yeah. And it's really crazy because all the water turns like green and yeah. greasy. Yeah. You know, the yeah. oil's coming yeah. off of them and yeah. stuff. Lipids it's wild. And, yeah. But that'll help kill, <clears throat> them, kill the bugs. Mm-hmm. And then I just hang them up for a few hours until they're drip dry. And then you can process them and take them to okay. uh, your indoor spot. That's going to help. But uh, watch out because, you know, some of them are going to survive. Yeah. One dose of anything doesn't kill everything. Right. So or you indu- induce more moisture. So now you may induce a mold issue depending on your so environment. I'm, I am I am crushing my IPM <laughs> at this point in the year okay. and my indoor grows because right. you know yeah. I anyway anyway it's true um, and so but once once you've got it in the barn you. Um, do you use machine then to bucket into uh, the machine totes? Machine works, but actually old school mechanical manpower, woman power, nice. works just as fast. Nice, nice. Just as fast. Thanks for a good product, We've got too. a few little tricks that we've been fine-tuning, but it's just as quick to start the mower, as I say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you're just constantly choking that stick and stripping yeah. it. You yeah. know? So it's just repetitive work. That's what you takes do. Takes a long time. Takes, yeah. takes a while. Yeah. You're going to have a dedicated crew. You do. Yeah. <laughs> I have a good crew. I have a really good crew. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm very proud of the crew That's I've got. That's good. They, do you see really any good. sort of like trimming um, companies that are starting up or anything like well, that? Well, there's different or? processes. We're going to see a lot of stuff come out next year. Um, even just JT and I working together this year within the two or three different farms. Uh, there's different sizes and plants i've got some pretty good sized plants that some are still hanging in the barn (coughs) excuse me um where we've harvested and helped harvest other fields that fairly small plants you know and so there's this variety of uh what do you do with a stalk that's you know a quarter in diameter versus a stalk that's larger than a tuna can you know i mean they're just they're good size good size stalks so Mm -hmm. how do you process that so there's machines that are coming out there are people that are developing them this year um, excuse me, <clears throat> and um, it'll be a dryer, separator, pre-processor, kind of get it ready for biomass. Okay. So uh, that's coming. It's it's we've got to improve our our um, labor force, uh, either more people or more machinery to replace people, like building cars, right? Sure. At some point, the robots take over. Um, yeah, that's right. So that's kind of where this is moving into is the mechanical right. era. Do, do you, you think know? it's you're going to sacrifice quality? Some, to some degree. I've seen some really harsh uh, harvesters where it just looks like it pulverizes everything. You see Keef go everywhere. Mm. Um, you know, when I see dust, I see money leaving the room. You know, because that's the Keef. That's the money. You're a trichome that's, that's, farmer. Yeah, I'm a trichome farmer. That's it. I'm a mm-hmm. pharmaceutical compound farmer. That's, that's it. That's right. You know, and so uh, we're looking just for the compounds. This grass is pretty, but I want what's on it. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Know? And that's important and to that's remember, it. too. The medicine, on it. the medicine is on the outside. 
not, yeah. not the inside this of the plant. This is just the carrier. Now, yeah. the inside of the bud has lots of outsides of other buds in it's it. It's that crystal. Right? But all yeah. that shiny stuff on there, that's what you're that's looking the, to get. That's the money. So yep. back to yeah, harvesting for wholesale. You know, I'm harvesting for wholesale to sell that compound. And so an aggressive machine scares me. When I see a lot of aggression with the machine, mm -hmm. I see that as high output for 10 to 50 to 150 acres. Mm. But when we get into the 10 acre and less, a more hand harvested, get in there. yeah, boutique type, get in there and get the work done. Yep. It's just as fast. Yep. Really. Yep, in, it's in true. The the Especially once you get after it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It took me a little bit as I was going and and of course for for me, my purposes uh, because I have patience, you know, I feel that strong mm -hmm. sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these buds were really mm -hmm. nice big buds, but I really tore them down. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I dismembered all of those buds almost to the top to make sure that there was no Botrytis nice hiding clean. in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's so important. true. It's important. That's right. That's right. All part of the fun. Yeah. I mean, even after we we're done doing our post harvest, we still send out for another full panel just to mm -hmm. make sure the CBD numbers are straight. The THC hasn't changed drastically because mm -hmm. uh, it will move on you after yep. harvest. Yep. Um, yeah. And then just see if any molds or anything's mm -hmm. in. Probably adds used. a little extra assurance for your buyers it as does. well. Yep. Yeah. Transparency to the buyer. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that's important. perfect. That's perfect. Well, mm -hmm. hopefully we get to grow in and now now you do consulting as well. That's right. Yeah. That's indoor right. and outdoor. Yeah. Awesome. Builds, uh, product development, all of it from, from seed to sale. Very nice. Yep. Very yep. nice. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Taproot Ag. Mm -hmm. John Smoke a Bowl Cena. <laughs> <laughs> He's with us in the house. That's an easy way to remember it, right? <laughs> well, I'll never forget. People it. can't say my last name sometimes, so it's Smoke a Bowl Singa. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cool. Well, folks, I'm, I'm not going to keep us all night long here, although, you know, I could sit and chat with John Plenty forever. we can talk about. You're going to come back and yeah, see us sometime? Absolutely. I love coming down here. All These right. are my peeps. All absolutely. right. Absolutely. Evolution Magazine. <laughs> yeah. Shout out. That's how we you do know, it. I love the love and support. I love the crew yeah. here. Always making it happen. Cat King Films. Cat King Films. That's right. Level Up <laughs> AV. That's how we do it. Evolution got Magazine James making back it there, happen. Casey Weed Blog. Yeah, you know? for sure. Boom, boom, and dropping them. We love it. Now, uh, Missouri Cannabis Industry Association loves to be sponsorship for this. Part of our mission is education mm -hmm. of the industry. That goes all the way from our patients. <laughs> Always sneaking. Get back here. I, I got one last pitch, dog. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, in order to make this happen, though, we got to have members that are down with it. You know, think about it like uh, Patreon, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. If you like the sort of stuff that we support, if you like these sort of shows, bringing education down to everybody, you know, think about coming over and being a member. MOCIA.org. Check us out. Uh, it can be actually cheap, even if it's a one-time sort of deal. That's quite all right. Uh, we don't mind at all. Come through yeah. and see us. Uh, much love. Clay, you going to take us home? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Do thank it. you guys so much. Uh, what a great show. They were talking about. Uh, thanks for panning up. I didn't stand up straight now. Um, uh, they were talking earlier about uh, soil propagation and how it roots and stuff spread. and stuff. That's what this is. This is all a, a network of uh, local people that are activists, that are experts in different fields, the hemp industry over here with, uh, with John, and then, of course, MCIA, Eric. Um, we're all multi-talented people in different areas, but it's the fact that we all come together that makes these strong plants survive. And uh, in this scenario, it's an industry that's uh, taking care of people that were here a long time before us, that have passed on education and have st are still around here to offer that education like we're doing tonight. So thanks so much, Eric, for being a part of the show. And thanks, John, for jumping in unexpectedly. Uh, both these guys have a lot to offer the industry, and they're just taking care of the community, and I'm happy to be uh, around them tonight. Uh, a big thanks to Joni Harshman uh, and Ryan Hutton. Uh, those, the, once again, they're doing amazing things uh, in the industry, bringing together law enforcement with patient rights, and, and it's just amazing. We're going to continue to follow them and do some more live shows with them and maybe even a few live shows. We talked about this earlier uh, during the break about doing a live show with one of uh, both their, both their trainings and, uh, and doing it uh, basically showing what they're doing and then talking about what they're doing and getting your feedback on how we can continue to work together to make it all better and, and, and faster and, 
uh, and all those things. So thanks so much for walking, uh, watching tonight. Thanks to uh, James uh, with uh, Level Up AV, Cat uh, again, uh, Cat King Films, doing some amazing uh, video editing uh, and amazing uh, production work on both both sides there. Chris Dalton's in the house. Thank you for uh, uh, letting ha letting us have this fine establishment and uh, and then also uh, uh, giving some great products to home growers and advice to home growers. So thanks to Happy Rock Farms for letting us do this here. And uh, thank you at home for watching. So good night, you guys. See have a good night. Come see us. <laughs>